Good evening. In June of 2015, uh, we launched the Glass Cannon Podcast. We dropped three episodes that day. And when we started doing the show, it was really, we, we had a couple goals in mind, and they were pretty simple. We wanted to do the best that we could with uh, what little equipment and, and time that we had. Uh, and we wanted to really recreate the experience that we had where we thought, I think people would find this really funny and entertaining. Uh, you know, it all started with the game that Joe and Skid and I had, and, and, and that's what we wanted to recreate. I think that we just believed that what we did was different and could be something that a lot of people would be interested in consuming. And so we launched that show, and, and we also hoped that we'd gain a following from it. We hoped that people would listen to it and uh, We hoped enjoy that a it. single person outside of our friends would listen to it. <laughs> yeah. One person. That one person our, that, that didn't already one. know us. <laughs> <laughs> that was goal number one, and, and that happened. And then it happened pretty quickly that we, we were getting more and more people that didn't know us, leaving iTunes reviews. This is the show I've been waiting for, the show I've been looking for. We had a following. And as we started to gain this following, the one thing that everybody wanted was for us to do a second weekly show. <laughs> And at the time, we all had other jobs. Uh, this was still very much a hobby, a hobby that we put a lot of time and effort and energy into, but it was a hobby. We were making no money from it. Uh, and we thought if we could ever do a second show, we need to make sure that money is coming in to support the more time and effort and energy that would go into producing a second weekly show. We had to form a relationship with Paizo because we couldn't just start monetizing this without their permission. And that took a couple of years. And then finally, we, uh, we started a relationship with them and were made uh, the first official uh, podcast uh, that they ever, uh, you know, allowed other people to do. Licensed is the Licensed professional is the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> the parlance of business. I don't have a script here. Just speaking that from they the heart. Allowed other people to do. He's <laughs> speaking from the lit. heart. Let He's him go. He's <laughs> speaking from the heart about business relationships. <laughs> about business relationships. <laughs> Relationship. Well, it's important because we wanted to do more. We all we were like, let's do fucking skull and shackles, mommy's back. We're like, wait, 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 wait. We can't do any of this. <laughs> Unless we get permission to like monetize this, so maybe we could turn this. Maybe we could turn this into like a business. Can you imagine? And you, so, I was going to say, you know, one of the main things was was we had to have a space. We just couldn't keep yeah. record. We couldn't do two yeah. weekly shows out of someone's apartment anymore. No. Like we just had, we all had significant others, and it was just it wasn't an option. And we didn't really do the math of what that would cost. We were just <laughs> like, let's start a Patreon, and if we ever hit what's a ridiculous number ten thousand dollars a month <laughs> we'll launch a second podcast that'll give us some time to get our bearings start recouping some of our losses as patreon money trickles in uh how long did it take us to hit that after we launched the patreon joe four months four months we hit ten thousand we actually hit it during gen con 50 while we were there and mm. we made a big deal about it because we knew we were close and we're like you know what if we hit it here then we had already talked about what we wanted to do. Why don't we just announce it? We were doing a show there. It was our first Gen Con. Uh, Matthew wasn't there, but it was uh, Skid, Grant, myself, and Joe. And we did a show with Eric Mona. And uh, it was just a ridiculous show. It was the first time we saw like uh, our listeners and uh, in person in a big setting like that. And uh, at the end of the show, I stood up and announced that we'd be doing Starfinder, the first AP dead sons and from there uh we did not record that was august and we didn't start recording until february because one of the other things that we wanted to do is make sure we didn't just do uh, a, a glass cannon clone we needed we needed uh new voices and we went and did an exhaustive search to try and find that voice <laughs> and it was very very hard because one of the things that makes us who we are is our chemistry and you can't create chemistry uh, just like you can't force chemistry you can't teach chemistry you either have it or you don't and so it was nerve-wracking me like how are we going to do this the reason people listen to us is this f five friends sitting around a table how are we got to like create someone to be our friend <laughs> <laughs> we don't have so any more friends no we're, no. Out of, we're out of actual friends 
<laughs> well, we, we certainly didn't have any friends like Eleanor DiLorenzo. No. And we met Ellie. And uh, Ellie, I can still remember sitting in the coffee shop with you uh, on oh. 7th Ave. Do you remember? Just chalking. You were so excited. And I was so and excited. I feel bad for that encounter because I don't know if you remember this, but you told me a specific coffee coffee shop. I... El, very on brand for Eleanor Di Lorenzo went to the wrong coffee shop mm-hmm. <laughs> and then forced you to come to that one uh, in the snowstorm. Wow. <laughs> and you, it was a blizzard. And you, were, and you were so polite about it. And this was like right before Force Awakens came out. And you were like, I have to go to this, this Star Wars, next Star Wars movie. And I remember, and you n- didn't give me any shit for it. You were like, no, no, this is fine. I, 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 I don't mind getting into the blizzard. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we we were talking about disorganized play uh, because that's that was gonna be my audition. Yeah, that was basically your audition, and and we we threw you into that, and then we we said this is this is the right fit, and and we threw you into an impossible situation, joining uh, five already established people, <laughs> and you knocked it out of the park. When was the maple syrup episode? Seven. Episode seven. Five. Episode it might five. have been six. But five, six seven. Five. I think it was seven. I thought it was five. Hmm. Okay. And uh was it five? And we've just been doing this now since what, 2017? Was that February of 2017 that we started recording and then we launched it later that year? I can't remember. All the the days and months and weeks sort of blend together because now we put out uh an absurd amount of content. But you know, we we knew one thing I always wanted to do is do more video. I wanted to get I wanted to get more video going, and I thought that this was the show to try it out. And I think we should make a set that will eventually destroy, and we should bring <laughs> in more people, not only another cast member, uh, but people behind the scenes. And that's where we met Sydney and brought Sydney in, and David, who we met at, at PaizoCon. I was like, I think this guy could be uh, like a like a rules lawyer, like a Tony Reale on a. Uh, what is that? Pardon my inter- pardon the interruption. Yeah. Uh, and and Anne uh, Anne was producing, and we were in studio, and we did all of what six episodes before COVID hit. And I mean, you go back and look at those episodes. Those are the Harry T episodes. Those are like some of the some of the hottest apps that we did. And then COVID just punched everybody in the nuts, and and it stopped, and we put it on hiatus, and then we were able to come back, and I don't know. It's just been a a crazy run, a wild run. I don't think I'd I'd, I'd really change too much of it. Uh, any of the stuff I change would be just to make it better. Um, but like, it is the show that it is, and tonight is the last episode. Oh, which okay. is which is intense. There's a lot of emotions. I think all of us have our own uh, feelings about it. But I really, and I said this before the show to all of you, I really want it to be a celebration. I think it can be a celebration. Because while it's sad to see something ending, I'm excited to to, to be able to finish a story. I've never finished as a GM a, a story of this magnitude. And, and I think what, what we have an opportunity to do tonight is something that we as a group uh, have never done before. Um, so if you're sitting at home and you, and you, and you're having a drink, uh, alcoholic or non-alcoholic, raise a glass, uh, cause tonight we are going to try and do something really fun to celebrate the final episode of Androids and Aliens. Cheers. Cheers, Androids and Aliens. Cheers, Androids and Aliens. Oh, let's, let's start by talking just a little Wait, bit, uh, a little Troy, softball. I'm sorry. Hold on. Yeah. I just want to point out, Skid is popping champagne. <laughs> <laughs> no, so nice. <laughs> a bottle of Love Clicquot. Oh, oh, dude. Oh, oh, oh. Stuff. Oh, Wait a minute. Is that wow. Johnny Halfling's jacket? <laughs> this is the Johnny Halfling jacket. <gasps> oh, oh, my God. God. The of Love Clicquot were broken out only for special occasions. Yeah. You pulled oh, that out well, of the glass display uh, display box. my commemorative Burger King uh, Lord of the Rings <laughs> goblet <laughs> wow. since 2001. Amazing. I'm going to cry about I, this. <laughs> Not the episode. This have, is so I wonderful. Have three, I have three drinks prepared. Um, I have lingonberry champagne, um, Ooh, classic. but I didn't find a flute glass, so it's in a wine glass. I'm going to get wasted. And and then I have <laughs> Wolfer Rosé uh, cider. And then I have, a sh- I didn't find a shot glass, uh, so I have, but I have uh, some Swedish snaps as well, uh, made mm. from elderflower. Uh, I don't know what moment will prompt me to finish this. We'll see. You'll know. Uh, but... 
I'll know. die <laughs> tonight <laughs> with this show. Just so you know. Just so you know, when you end this show, I will die from alcohol poisoning as well. Yeah. I so remember when fun. we when we <laughs> took the show up a notch, bringing in David and Anne and Sydney, and we were going live. All in that big group setting, I remember a couple times where Ellie just had this a couple drinks in front of her and was just like <laughs> just like nipping at him here and there, not doing too crazy. And I remember just like looking across at her sometimes and being like, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can just see in her face like she's gone too far. <laughs> I, know, it's so amazing. I know I miss it so much. It the was other- so dangerous though because I was drinking from David. joy. <laughs> well, David would just bring us well, treats, treats every yeah. time. Yeah. Like I would come 14% in and I'd be like, treats. Well, yeah, I'd be like, oh, I have to drink this 16% beer on camera. So, well, all right, here I go. Yeah, There's exactly. six bottles He'll- in America. And uh, <laughs> did you want to try? <laughs> of course I want to try. <laughs> but yeah, Sydney, you can really stand your alcohol though. Like you had, you downed a lot of beer, like 16% beer. I was drinking a lot on stream. Yeah. I think because I was nervous because I was new and I was like, oh, I want to do good. And also everyone was like having a good time. And it was really fun. It was fun to be in, in person, obviously. Um, but yeah, beer. I don't know. I can pace myself with beer. You have one. You have two. You're having a good time. You have three. I think four <laughs> beers is where I say good night and I have to yeah. go home. <laughs> but I don't know. Do you guys remember I was drinking? I think this was also part of the live show. I was drinking from Troy's glass. We have like, we had different you know, names glass. on the glasses oh, and yeah. I <laughs> always took Troy's glass and licked right. on it a lot just to, yeah. because I know that it's going to freak out. I threw it uh, out. Yeah, <laughs> no, you did it. Shut up. <laughs> I threw it out the window not. and it shattered on You're an old liar. You're a liar. He did not. He did what not. Were you going to say, Grant? It. Oh, no, it just, it wasn't just Troy's glass. Every time we would look over, Ellie would always have some sort of concoction in one of these very thoughtful pair of glasses. Someone sent in a glass yeah. with each one of our names Carrie. on it. It would always Carrie be did. someone else's. Just Carrie. Yeah. Carrie sent in these beautiful Carrie. glasses, and every time Ellie would have someone else's glasses in front of her. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> yeah. every time. Sitting in the cap. Like, perfectly <laughs> there. It's there. Perfectly fine. <laughs> yep. Ah, uh, God. Those, the, we, I, what do, I, I say six episodes, so, and we were doing two at a pop because we were recording two and then releasing them. We were doing it every two weeks. Was it six episodes or was it eight? It couldn't have been I think more. it was eight. I think it was eight. It eight. I think it was four weeks. Yeah. I think we did four it four weeks. times. Four weeks, and right. I mean, wow. it was, you, you felt like, this is an exaggeration, obviously, but it had that feeling like you were backstage at Saturday Night Live. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that vibe. We had people coming and like sitting, like some of our uh, our special guests would like sit in the balcony and watch. I mean, it yeah. was. Dell came by. Nick would like pop in like. Yeah, it was We great. had the red carpet show where we literally yeah. had guests yeah. like the episode in studio. 100. That's right. Oh, it was so fun. It was yeah, such a on. dream. Such mm-hmm. a dream. And, you know, it ended too short, but you watch those episodes and, and that energy is infused into those eps. Mm-hmm. So goofy. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you, of all our shows, this is the one that is, has translated as easily to, to home recording because of the, the chemistry that we've built up uh, together. So I wanted to ask you guys what uh, your favorite memory of the show is. I think that'd be a fun opening banter topic. Uh, it's probably hard to narrow it down to just one. Uh, but uh, what are your what's your favorite memory or favorite memories of the show? David, you were a, a, a listener, a fan first before you became a, a hired help. Yeah, well, and I'll there's been plenty of great moments and I'm sure we'll hit a lot of them. My favorite is still, uh, and this is one of the first episodes I was on in studio was Harry T. And (laughs) I remember laughing so hard during that, that I was worried I was going to wake up with like abdominal bruising (laughs) and just trying to stay far enough away from the mic that I wasn't just completely peeking and blowing it out. But I just, I've never laughed harder. I think at any of your content across any of the shows, (laughs) except for that one bit. Oh, I'm yeah, so glad we was, were alive for that. And that was, yeah. <laughs> and that's the same for me. Uh, mine is the, uh, it's the, the funniest moment in the history of the show and maybe across all of our shows. And that was the final moments of our hang with the crew of the rusty rivet <laughs> and Dax talking to the other Android. That's that my was, favorite. That's my favorite yeah. moment. It is the, fi- I think it's my favorite moment of all of our shows ever. Uh, especially in terms of comedy. I mean, it was, we couldn't even speak. It was, it was so funny. <laughs> the amount That's of times it, yeah. that people came up to me and shouted satisfactory and that satisfactory oh, turned into yeah, his own t-shirt. That, that came out of that I've too. I've never right? lost 
my shit so hard as when Troy responded after eating uh, Ellie's Blood sausage. 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 Blood sausage. <laughs> Satisfactory! Satisfactory! <laughs> I think for me, both in terms of the content and just like the, the emblematic nature of how we led up to it is Good Morning Glip Glorp. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Roger Glip Glorp. I, yeah. I have said this to a number of listeners over the years, but... Being around Troy sometimes means you have to be the SME to his Captain Hook. You're in a constant state of SME around yes. Troy. <laughs> and you say things and you make suggestions and you riff off of what he's done and you and you try to you try to like feed him and throw him the ball and he tells you you're an idiot and he tells you you should be dead for even thinking <laughs> something and he says a number of horrible things and then about a, and then a little while later he'll be like you know I had this great idea. <laughs> you do exactly what you said and you just have to sit there and just smile and nod and glip glorp i feel like we we we, we smeed that into existence with troy and he hated it and he dragged his feet and then i still think it's one of the best hours we've ever done you yeah. did that to what? me twice you did that with glip glorp and you did that with the halloween party oh, yes oh yeah yeah yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 two very different things and both just very very well written very well written the, the good morning glip glorp open is such an amazing so piece of written prepared comedy. <laughs> it's spectacular. You know, yeah. like the Rusty Rivet thing is improv, and that's that's just funny. But like that Glib, Glib Corp is scripted and still that mm -hmm. funny. It's it's amazing. Mm. That's fun. Yeah, and you know, I I have an awe about doing. I'm like, God, I want to do this. But then we, I'm having so much fun, right? And I'm just like, what's gonna make Skid laugh? <laughs> that's all. I, yeah, that's, that's my bar. bar. <laughs> like, how do I make Skid laugh? All right. I still remember, God. like, we, we all remember, uh, you know, those moments. Of, I don't know. I I keep coming back to just from the moment he popped his head. Glipgort popped his head into the dressing room and he had like the napkin around his neck. Makeup napkin. Makeup napkin. <laughs> and he's just like, hey, everybody okay or whatever. You know, yeah. the imagery, it was just like, it was perfect. It was so perfect. <laughs> Ellie, what about you? You got any favorites you can pull out? Uh, I really, oh man, there's a lot, but I, I really enjoyed uh, the ending of book four. Uh, with the uh, with the epilogue you did. Uh, was that four or three? I always forget. Three, maybe three or four. It like it was three, after yeah. the Halloween part. It was, yeah, uh, was, three, it was yeah. a build. It was a build up for what what was to come before we went to Little Ishtamak and yeah, it was the midway point of the series from dust till yeah. gone episode eighty one. Mm. Oh yeah, it's it was really really nice. I lo I remember feeling very amped up. But like I have I have like millions and millions of of moments little mo moments that i love like i remember when everyone got a bottle cap except me we were in the studio and after a while i just i just started screaming and swearing and just went to the liquor closet and just started drinking whatever you guys had there and just left you know and uh and then i don't remember more from that night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the liquor closet. <laughs> Sydney, any favorites from uh, from listening before you joined or from 95 on or 96, whenever it was? From listening before I joined, I always thought the maple syrup bit was really funny because it was so random. It was just so random. I was like, Ellie's hilarious. That's so funny. But then mm -hmm. when I joined. It was episode we, six, by the way. You ah, looked it up. Episode six, the, the invention of the maple syrup. But then when I joined and Mac died and then like Linnea came about we mentioned the maple syrup again and there's, a, <laughs> there's a specific episode oh, where Ellie yeah. is like the Uncle Paul or like Uncle Uncle Phil. Phil. she's all Uncle over the place Phil. she fucked up her backstory I mean that is the, one of the it best moments the, if I'm not mistaken top 10 it's either the same episode or at the very least the same night as Harry T. As Harry I think T. it is. Yeah, I, I think, think it, it is. 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 We were, that is a, an absolute grand God. slam episode. We were yeah. on a or, or fucking night, roll. Either way. It was just you sent me the so scene. funny. <laughs> so the guy who's <laughs> there with Donovan. Donovan was the last night. She had the necklace. And she had like the maple syrup necklace. She was like, I had this from my uncle. And you were like, no, you don't. You don't. You don't have him. None of this happened. Oh, None of this happened. happened. You were mistaken <laughs> for someone who was in that commercial. Oh. <laughs> you actually had nothing to do with Oh me. my god, that was the same night as Harry T. <laughs> oh, can you, Troy, can you do Harry T's voice just for fun? Watch me do the sick jab. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, you're, the fate of the world is at stake, and she's just showing off her moves. 
it's amazing. Yeah, I'm playing a horse. Who, who was it that yeah, played was it, horse? Was it PG or was it Linnea or PG? PG, PG played PG horse with her. Play horse. <laughs> yeah, I beat I beat your ass on horse. Yeah, uh, and still don't. But then you guys explain, of course. Sometimes people are like, "Do they explain things to you, Ellie, between the episodes?" And I'm like, "It's fifty fifty. Sometimes." They do. <laughs> Grant, what about you, Grant? Oh, satisfactory is probably up there. Uh, I really enjoyed improving with you, uh, Qualo's. Uh, oh, last dance. Yeah. I mean, that was. Oh. I, didn't, I didn't know that was happening until yeah, it I think happened. That was, the, that was the best dramatic moment of the show. I think. I, for I, sure. I, yeah. We, yeah. We skipped all over all the dramatic moments. Yeah. Nah, I mean, there's been a Friss and Stee when Stee, when Stee was created from uh, like uh, that whole that was so space cool. Odyssey was so cool. That was awesome. Uh, I mean, going back to the Koala one was so Max great Death, because. Yeah. I didn't know who was going to do it. And it never right. dawned on me that it would be Qualo. And so there was just so great. I just didn't see Grant doing that, I guess. And I, I saw Qualo as being there till the end. So I just to bring that back, like that was just a really cool moment for me because it was like, here's a choice. Who's going to take it? And it was you. And it allowed you to like do it, but also close a storyline for him revealing about uh, the throat thing, which you and I knew about for a long time, but they didn't. Since, so. uh, since that finale Ellie brought up, I think it was. Yes. That was where it was introduced, where he clutches at his throat. The box. And the, yeah, yeah. The box. Yep. Oh, wow. A lot of good shit. dramatic moments. What's I mean, you, you can't beat Mac, the sacrifice of Mac. You know what I mean? I think that's right. one. Not enough people talk about it. But to me, that was an unwinnable encounter. And we did something that like you just dream of being able to do in role playing. Like, what if we No, we can't do that? Can we? And then Mac says, but just pull the trigger. That was that was great to end it the book one like, like that. Yeah, I think I, you really nailed it by saying it was a little bit like uh, spoilers for Game of Thrones season one, but it was a little like Mac was positioned a little bit to be sort of, a, I don't know, a, in my world, a lead. Yeah. <laughs> but captain. then, you know, got her head cut off at the end of the season, you know, yeah. uh, like where another was, character. Where was everybody? The, Mac was obviously out tangling with the, with the Gregor call. Dax All was like us, on the you bridge. were on the ship. Yeah, and I ran, you Kreska were ran into the control room back and like into the control room. Took it, damage from the explosion. It, it was very tense getting up to that moment because like the only reason we got to the controls was because Mei Shun Mage handed a door open like as part of an action to let like Friss through to get to those controls. And I remember and like, got a bottle cap for it. Bottle not, cap. Yep. Not remembering like it was so tense thinking about what we were going to do because this thing could just walk through walls. You know, it yeah, was just the scariest itself. enemy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Completely broken encounter, uh, but oh, I don't know. It just uh, it, there's so much. There's so much. That's why I was, it was kind of nice. Obviously, I would like to see Linnea uh, get here, where uh, uh, she was a big part of uh, two of your characters' uh, stories. But uh, to be able to bring PG back like this, I always imagined uh, PG would be in my epilogue. I just was. I was like, oh, PG's going to come back in the epilogue. Uh, but mm -hmm. to be able to do that and have us. Uh, weave a story to bring back Harry T and see your journey back through time was nice. The la if you, I don't know if we'll ever go back. If any of you will go back and listen to like these last 10, 20 episodes, but like it has been, you can scent, you can feel it the way we've been playing, the way we've been tying up storylines. Like it really has felt like a television show, even though this is a completely unscripted, uh, ultimately unscripted, um, improvised game. And so that's why tonight I am excited to to finish this story with you because I've got notes. I don't even know what to do with all these notes because it is so dependent on, you know, decisions and, and choices you make because I want right up until the end the uh, power to be in your hands. So without further ado, I think it's time we begin. Let's start by, I don't know, uh, let's do this. Imagine, if you will, a uh, quaint suburban neighborhood within the world of the Starfinder galaxy. So, uh, sure, it's futuristic. Uh, maybe there are robot paper boys rolling high, firing out the local newspaper <laughs> like a T-shirt gun uh, with pinpoint precision so it lands on each suburban home's doorstep. 
Maybe there are uh, electronic lawn mowers trimming each lawn to perfection. Whatever kind of suburbia you can imagine in this fictional Starfinder world, that's the scene that we open up on. And we then close in on one of these houses where a figure is standing at the front picture window, looking out and down the street. As we get closer, we realize it is a female skittermander. Cut to inside of the house. From behind, we can see that the skittermander is, is noticeably nervous. She looks out and down the street like she's waiting for something or someone. Suddenly we hear the sound of a door opening from somewhere deeper in the house. The woman turns with a start and coming out of the bedroom is Tumsy Fitchpork. <laughs> oh. oh God. He looks so happy. He's like, hi, honey. Oh. Can you believe it? Today's the day. I am going out on an actual mission. <laughs> Tumsy's wife tries to hide her concern. It's, it's, it's truly amazing, Tumsy. You've, you've, you've worked so hard for this. I just, I just, I don't know. I just, I want you to be safe. Oh, Mumsy. Don't you worry about old Tumsy. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not heading into the Cascavellian wilderness alone. They are sending me out there with a group of starfinders. If I'm helpful, maybe they'll make me an actual Starfinder someday. Oh, Tomsy, says Mumsy. <laughs> I just, I just want you to come back in one piece. Oh, oh, so God. many pieces. Oh, Tomsy's <laughs> just thinking to himself. He's like, just think of it. Starfinder Society member Tomsy Fitzpork. <laughs> It's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Just rolls right off the tub. <laughs> Tumsy can see that Mumsy is doing her best to put on a brave face. So he, he walks over to her, puts his hands on her little skittermander shoulders. <laughs> Listen, Mumsy. <laughs> it's okay to be scared. Hell, maybe I'm a little scared too. But I've studied my whole life for a moment like this. If I'm able to discover the remnants of a lost civilization or who knows what, we'll be set for life. But listen, let's be honest. Accidents happen all the time. If for some reason I don't make it back. Tumsy, don't say that. Listen to me, Mumsy. <laughs> If for some crazy reason, something happens to me, I just want you to make me one promise. Anything for you, Tumsy. If I die, don't ever have sex with anyone else for the rest of your life. <laughs> oh, no. That's so mean. Mumsy. Mumsy wow. nods very stoically at Tumsy. My Sneezna will always be yours, Tumsy. <laughs> <laughs> Another sound of a door opening as three Skittermander children come rushing from their bedrooms into the main living space. Mumsy wipes away her tears to look strong in front of the children. Tumsy gets down to one knee as the children rush into his arms. Daddy, don't go! Don't go, Daddy! No, now you listen to me, Nipsy, Flipsy, and Dipsy. You listen to me. Daddy's gonna be just fine. In fact, your daddy may come back to be a Starfinder. Now, Tumsy, don't you be getting them all riled up. Tumsy says, oh shit, look at the time. I gotta go. Get over here, give your dad a big hug. He hugs the children tightly and then stands up and pa 
passionately kisses Mumsy, twirling her around <laughs> like she's on a dance floor and he's dipping her. The kids are like, Mom, Dad, gross, stop it. <laughs> Tumsy looks at his wife, Mumsy. I love you, Mumsy. <laughs> I'll always love you. Goodbye, kids. I'll be back in a few weeks. You take care of your mama. And Tumsy grabs his pack and heads out the door. And they all stand at the window watching him get into his car. And before he gets in and closes the door behind him, he looks at them all and says, Tumsy! <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he gets into the car. They're all laughing and, and waving as he drives off. And we cut to a drone shot of the car driving down the street. Ominous music playing in the background. <laughs> Toward Cabaret. <laughs> Blackout. Pumsy. Now the lights come back <laughs> on the bridge of the Empire of Bones. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. You have survived <sighs> the most difficult battle you've ever seen as a team. It was a close one. This was a combatant unlike any you've faced, using magics you were not accustomed to, and you survived. Every single one of you survived, and now the bridge is yours, but the mission is not over. You all can now turn and look out the cockpit and see in the distance, still pretty far, the gateway, the gate of the 12 suns. A gateway into another dimension, wide open, with this huge super weapon emerging from it. Osteth told you there's really only one option, and you have intuited that that option is flying a ship like the size of the Empire of Bones directly into the Stellar Degenerator to destroy it and also yourselves, making the same sacrifice that Mac made and Qualo for the greater good. As you catch your breath here after the battle, what is everybody doing? Doctor, would you be so kind as to seal off the bridge? Chris nods and goes about it. Um. So first you walk over to the dais where Saravox was sitting and you start to examine it and it doesn't make any sense. There's no real computer system here. But you look and you see that a, there's like a hole, maybe I don't know, six inches in diameter at the back of the throne atop the dais. Mm -hmm. And so then you look over to Saravox and you see that attached to the back of his cranium is this like thing that goes down his spine and connects into the throne. And you realize that is must that must be how this ship is controlled. It's fused to Saravox's body. So someone would need to take that off, put it on them per yeah. permanently. Um, you know, it could be removed Jeez. later and sit atop the throne to control the ship. What skills would someone need to be able to control the ship using such a device? Um, well, once you uh, do that, you would have access to all controls. And it would, so it would be like computers checks or do we, or is it um, more just you have full control? Basically, of once of someone is in, they can just think of what to do and they can do it. I think you would think that, Friss, you don't even have to roll a check. You would think that like once someone is locked in, they're like the pilot and the captain and the engineer and they're gonna, they're gonna be the one that can like fly the ship, but it would allow you to at least access the computers if you weren't the one that fused to it. 
I volunteer to fuse myself to the ship. Captain, um, are you sure? I knew this would be a one-way mission for me, Doctor. I ask but one thing, and perhaps you might assist me once we gain control. Which is that we download all evidence of the corpus leads. Malfeasance on the Vescarium and transmit all evidence out and clear my family's name. Other than that, it would be my honor. Oh, man. And Friss is like digging his little claws into the palms of his hands. He's shaking with rage at himself. But he's in this situation where it's like everything is run on these systems. It's the one blind spot that he's always had. And with this like mystical, like anything like mystical, like he's still, he's done his work, but he's just never been able to pick it up the way he has almost anything else that he's tried. And he's so angry at himself for that flaw that he can't, because he doesn't believe in the no win situation. And, but there's no, but he's uniquely unsuited to help here, he feels like. Mm. And he doesn't want to do this. He doesn't want the captain to have to do this, but. Dax will step forward uh, and say, with all due respect, captain, I think that this is an unwise choice. I spoke previously with you about flying the Empire of Bones, should it come to that. I think you are a much greater asset to all of us if you are leading the mission to return to the Sarissa and captain the Sarissa out of this system safely. Without you, there is no captain. Dax, my wise friend, you know as well as I do the Sarissa is gone. And I hope there is a way out for all of you. But if there is anyone I would trust more than to escort my crew to safety, it is you. I am useless, for the most part, against these undead warriors. You all, on the other hand, may have the strength to best them. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. What happened to the service? It got blown up. It's completely blown up? It's back we on the controller moon. Yeah. Um, oh, okay, that's right. We took another one of their ships in here in disguise. Yeah, that's right. yeah. You left it there because there was another round of Marines coming, uh, corpse folk Marines, and you were like, "It's going to be easier for us to get past these, the Armada, yeah. if we're in one of their ships." Right. So Kreska will start walking forward towards the dais. If there is a way to get any of you out of here, I will soon know. Chris, you are a doctor. Um, has it been a while? When's the last time you did a uh, minor surgery? A uh, couple days, maybe. Yeah, it's kind of a, <laughs> a very common occurrence. <laughs> this yeah. morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's a quick job. You need to detach it from uh, Cerevox. That's the easy part. Uh, fusing it to Kresga will require a roll. But wait, 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 wait. Did you perform a minor surgery on Kreska within the last 24 hours? <laughs> <laughs> In that case, I think the entire mission has just gone down. Scuttled. <laughs> so we scuttled it. It's over. You can't go under general uh, anesthesia twice in the same 24 hours. And then it just plays the Curb Your Enthusiasm music, and that's the end of the series. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Um, <laughs> I forgot my keys! <laughs> um, oh, man. Um, oh, shit. What's uh, Sayun doing in PG and Callum? PG, uh, I think, uh, runs over to Callum, the boy, and uh, uh, gets him, him up. Uh, yeah, exactly. Ah! Fool! <laughs> Dumb fool! Lamb uh, <laughs> yeah. See what you did to the captain. See what you did. <laughs> this is your own fault. We would have all survived if it wasn't for you. Um, no, she will. <laughs> she will get the boy up on his feet. And uh, is he still be turning into a robot? That's my concern. No, we dispelled that. Honestly, it's like as, it's as if the uh, 
you know, the circuitry and stuff was like going back to veins. I'm sure it was painful, like a lycanthrope sort of transformation period. But he's yeah. back yeah. to he goes, I'm a real boy again. <laughs> oh, Pin- Pinocchio, you're from back. Uh, so I think PG, though, will feel um, she understands where the captain is coming from. And so she nods at the like the conversation that they're having. But um, and so she will say, Dex, if you will have me, I will help you guide the, the team to safety and give us a shot. Uh, Captain, I understand. Trust me, I understand the sacrifice. And it's been an honor. Kreska reaches out and takes PG's hand in, in hers and gives it a sturdy shake. Says, I cannot tell you how much it warms my heart to see you again, PG. Likewise, Kreska. And I think PG actually wraps Kreska in a bear hug. Yeah. We're probably the two tallest, two yeah. tallest of the, of the group, which is hilarious because we're the two shortest of the actual group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's funny how that works. The Vesk and the Mar- Maracoy, known enemies, hugging on the bridge of a bone <laughs> Enemies in the wild. Enemies in the wild. <laughs> Nat- natural, predators. <laughs> natural predators. <laughs> Hugging yeah. on the bridge of a bone ship. It's like a dodo video. <laughs> Sorry to get all tropey on you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. The Vesk hugs the Maracoy. <laughs> <laughs> this coming. What about Seiyan and Callum? Can Seiyan see the stellar degenerator from the bridge? Is it on display? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you just step up to the front cockpit window beyond where those mindless zombies are plugged in, you look out and you see uh, ships, like, flying around. Like, some some of them are pulling out and flying off. So imagine, say, Yun as, like, about a six-foot-tall in that range spec in front of a 30-foot-tall screen at the front of this ultranaut and this sea of activity and the weapon that could end all life as we know it in the galaxy in front of her. And as she's blinking, you see just scenes of Mei Shun being dragged beneath the acid on the Cult of the Devourer's hideout. And she's reliving that memory Mm -hmm. and the death of the person with whom she shares a great deal of genetic material. And she's thinking about the end for everyone else and the end for herself. And she's thinking about the cruelty of the implanted memories in her mind that happened to the person she looks just like and the person she understands to be Mei Shun's father and mother. And she said that she felt that she awoke alongside a great power and she sees that great power right in front of her and she feels purpose she feels untethered from but indebted to the memory of Mei Shun and she feels like she needs to stay alongside Captain Kreska until it's assured that the stellar degenerator is destroyed she does not want to attend an away mission Okay, Callum. All right. This is out of game, sort of, but there's one more spell that I had in a spell gem because I took some Technomancer feats with, like, other stuff, so I I have access to Technomancer spells. But there's something called Digital Doorway, and basically I gain the ability to step into a piece of electronic equipment connected to a communication or information network. Um... And it's like a teleport spell, but I get to enter a computer. I transform into data, I enter a computer, and I exit, and I learn information. And there's a whole complicated thing where it's like you detect other devices and you're aware of all unsecured devices, but I'm just wondering, can I use the spell in a way to like aid Kreska in what she's doing? Like to learn some information or like safeguard her from complete and utter like death if she puts on this device? Uh, I you don't know if you can safeguard her, but everything else is a yes. Okay. You just don't know this is a foreign alien technology, so you don't. You hope that you can 
prevent some sort of harm from coming to her. But you do feel confident that uh, once she accesses the system, that you would be able to use that to be of help. Okay. Um, Captain K. Yes, Callan. Um, I never questioned you because you were the first person um, to be a real captain. And I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done and for always protecting me and having my back and I have your back. So um, if you put that thing on and you start to go crazy, uh, I could help you. Um, and um, it's been really great to know you. Thank you. And Callum gives her a huge hug. Kreska just kind of pats his back. Thank you, Callum. It's been an honor to know you. And I would appreciate all the help I can get. Yes, Captain. Dax is um, <clears throat> thinking that uh, he's been feeling uh, very strange uh, and very uncomfortable uh, ever since that creature uh, over overloaded him. Is that what it's called? Overload? Something like that. Yeah, overload. Um, yeah, ever since that creature overloaded him, he's felt uh, a little sick, maybe, for lack of a better term, a little off. Um, and he goes to step forward. Uh, to insist uh, and he starts to say Captain I don't believe you are and he just stops and internally again there's a, 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 some sort of a glitch uh, is happening and there's this he, he for this weird very uncomfortable flash he has the sense of like someone speaking or someone saying something behind his eyes basically and it's just like, no, like, step back. And it's this very clear, and he, all of a sudden he's filled with this intense fear of plugging his consciousness into this computer. And it just <gasps> is like this huge, like, wave off. And he's just like, Captain, I must insist. I don't believe you're considering. And he just stops and, like, twitches a couple times. And he's like, best of luck, Captain. <laughs> and oh stands God. back. Uh. That's not unsettling at all. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, if you will. Chris is gonna do one last shot. He's just he's racking his brain to think of any other way to accomplish this at the last minute, cognizant of the limited time. Let's do one more engineering check, mysticism check. Uh mysticism. Natural oh, 20. Uh, it's 25. Uh, ooh. Okay. You're studying this. The whole time everyone else was talking, you're just staring at this thing. I imagine, like, what is this? Going back and looking at the throne, staring at this thing. And you realize that this is some sort of electroencephalon command key mm -hmm. that is tied in directly to Saravox that allows him access to any computer on the ship. But it's also tied to the engines, sensors, weapons, allowing people to, uh, anyone that's holding it, like if Kreska takes it, to feel the ship as an extension of her own body if she goes through this process. And it is the only way to even begin to access the computers. However, there's something else that you realize that while Kreska could use this and access it, it was tied into something with Saravox himself or themself. Mm -hmm. That it almost is like a soul cage, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word, where if this isn't destroyed, he could return. They oh. could return. Oh, cool. Mm. Oh, you shit. also think that this could be sold for enough credits to live your days any way you would want to live them. Oh, yes. Yes, unfortunately. Space casino. <laughs> Space casino? 
Saravos returns. Save the world. world. Space Casino. Save yeah. the world. <laughs> no, not the world, the universe. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so he realizes this. He's like, this really is, this really is the only way. And even if we found some other way to the address the super weapon, if this thing survived, we would still have to deal with this recurrent villain. So he just kind of just lets it all out in a shudder as it's just it all it, all this realization of like this final realization that this is the only way just kind of like releases this tension through his body just kind of like despairing but he like centers himself reminding himself what's at stake and he starts the process of attaching it to the captain all right so describe the scene for me as Kreska like laying down on the floor do you make space and like she removes her armor and you start fusing it to her <laughs> yeah and he start like he starts off with like a topical anesthetic just out of kind of habit and it tickles he's, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like you don't want infection it's like we'll all be dead in like 20 minutes it's like whatever <laughs> So, but yeah, he does some uh, Novocaine, some you know, dull the pain, and starts uh, surgery. Just little, la- little laser scalpel, just like cutting a careful incision into the back of her head. And uh, please try to stay still. Um, Sorry, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> always the worst. Uh-huh. Always the worst. God's damn patient. And just cuts through it and peels back the scaly flesh Ugh. and um, this is laser just kind of like drills little smoking holes like into the base of the skull stopping just short of the of the brain and shung, plugs the thing in carefully like a USB into a socket eventually it almost feels like it comes to life and just like crawls down the rest of her spine <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. That was most precise work. Thank you, Captain. And he just, all he does is he gives, like, puts his little claw on her shoulder and he gives her a little scratch and just pulls back, moves away. So Kreska, very, Dax, help me. She kind of gets herself up up to her feet and works her way up, up the stairs to the dais. And stands there. And do I just have, like, is my brain, do I just have full access of the ship in my head right now? You feel crazy town. You've got to sit and insert the base of the spine into the throne. I do so. (laughs) And I'm trying to think the best way to describe this sensation, but you feel like you're in virtual reality and at one with the ship. Like you could just make it go (laughs) fire, like you can do everything. But as you're locked in, everything is so alien to you. It doesn't feel like any ship you've been a part of. Like you obviously didn't pilot the Sarissa. Maybe you did some piloting back in the day, but like this just feels like a completely alien system that you can't, while you can control, you can't communicate with. Interesting. And is there like a, could I do a mysticism check to see, or do I need to, is there any way I could use my telepath, the telepathic nature of myself to maybe communicate with the zombies that are doing a lot of the work? On the, on the uh, you could try it, but as you look over there, uh, there's only like five of them that are still attached to the station because of all the AOE spells. <laughs> and even then, they're like, <laughs> they're yeah. not really functional. <laughs> yeah, <Sorry. laughs> yeah I mean, you can you can try to tap into them, and there's no there there for them. They're just like, they're receiving commands from several other sections of the ship these are the sense that you get you kind of feel emotions because it's a it's it's partly a language barrier thing but also partly like 
you're used to interfacing with a ship that you could just speak with. You right. don't have you don't have that here, um, Wait. at least right now. Guys, didn't we download Steve? Mm. We did. Can we, we did. upload Steve? <laughs> to be a translation yeah. unit? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I oh. mean, Fris has the USB stick with this I corrupted have mind. digital doorway, my very high-powered Technomancer spell in my spell gem. Well, this is what I'll say. With Kreska now having access to everything, you could use your digital doorway to bring Steve into the system. And you oh. think that there's a chance that Kreska could then <laughs> understand better what's happening. I think Callum turns to Friss and he says, um, Doctor, did did you get to download Steve? A date. And yeah, he pulls out pulls out the thumb drive with Steve on it. <laughs> so funny. It's a Steve on it's a, a piece of mask and tape. Steve with like Sharpie like written on it. Steve. I'd like to imagine smiley face. It's like a silly thumb drive that looks like, uh, you know, like a radio transponder or like a little mini ship. It's like rubber and opens up. <laughs> <laughs> looks like it's going into like a drive. Um, yeah, it Calum looks takes, like a skittermander. Oh, perfect. I popped the head off. Uh, <laughs> Callum takes it. Um, and he says, all right, I've um, captain permission to do something that I've never done. By all means. Chris, because like, She's still kind of like inter like <laughs> trying to internalize the feelings of a, a massive space cruiser now um, fused with her body. I think Callum just like puts his hands also on the dais or on like the computer screens and like focuses his energy and he puts the USB stick like in his mouth, just like holds it in his teeth and like is focusing. Oh. And then <laughs> <laughs> and then uh calm down. As he's concentrating, <laughs> suddenly you see him endgame-esque, you know, like turning into this sort of like vapor air nanite looking cloud and just like <laughs> disappears, just like into the computer screen, gone. This is amazing. So Callum and Steve <laughs> enter the mainframe. <laughs> oh my God. Kreska has in just the hell? accessed with the electroencephalon command key. <laughs> <laughs> and you get inside, and I mean, this now we're getting into like cyberpunk, like you are yeah, jacked yeah, in. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're in, you are a part, you are physically part of the data stream as well as digitally a part mm. of it. And you have Steve with you, and I imagine this playing out where it's like you see yourself standing there, like a holographic version of yourself. And you look over, and there's just this guy in a suit <laughs> standing next to you. Um, are you Steve? I, yes, I believe I am. That's what you look like? I don't know, I can't see myself. Am I handsome? Let me describe. You're wearing a suit, two-piece suit. It's nice. Mm. Uh, you have sort of like a wafty-looking haircut. Uh, you're handsome. I would say like a solid eight out of ten. An eight out of ten. Pretty good. Ten out of ten. Steve, I need your help. <laughs> Wait, one more question. <laughs> what would I have to do to get to a nine or a ten? <laughs> Uh, tie, uh, tighter pants. Your pants are too loose. It's not the 80s anymore. You can wear tighter pants. Ah, yes. To show off my bulge. <laughs> Man, I really wish... I really wish Linnea was... Oh, no. Steve. <gasps> oh. Linnea? Doesn't know. Is she <laughs> into bulges? <laughs> Why would you bring that up? I thought you two had a... I could sometimes hear through the wall in my room. Linnea's oh, no. room was next to mine. You guys would talk to each other at night. Anyway, um, That was our time. But, <laughs> so, tighter pants, show off the goods. All right. Well, if I ever have this opportunity again, I will wear tighter pants. 
I'll tell everybody on board that you're really a hot guy. Please do. I will. Can you explain what's happening right now? I <laughs> haven't seen you in a while and never like this. Where are we? We're on a different ship. The Sarissa has gone. Um, this is a, a doom ship and we're actually flying it toward uh, death, basically. It's the Gate of the Twelve Suns and um, we have to save the universe. So Kreska is risking her life um, by piloting the ship with her brain and we can't understand the language and, and we can't figure it out and um, you're kind of our uh, kind of our last ditch effort and I hope you could maybe translate for her the captain um, and the whole crew we're all here and uh, we're risking our lives all of us so we're gonna die all of that makes sense to me <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What would you like me to do? He's just looking around at all the circuitry. If you could, um, if you could find the, the central hub for language, um, and, and be able to, to, to translate it or, or to make it make sense and make it easier for Kreska, she can feel the ship, but she, she can't communicate with it. So maybe you could speak for the ship to, to her. Hmm. Yes, I think that might be possible. I'm not familiar with a mainframe of this size, but I think with enough time I could access it. It is strange, though. I feel as if... I feel as if we are not alone. Hmm. Oh. oh. Terrifying. You mean like, like a, like a, a virus? Or, or like a, a Trojan horse or something? Or like... I cannot put my finger on it, as you might say, or my bulge. <laughs> Is that you an expression s- in your world? No. No, no, no I no, just no. can't put really. my bulge on it. I can't put my I bulge on it. I regret the thing I said about the pants. You should keep the pants big. I honestly fully regret it. You don't need to have tighter pants. I think it would be bad for society. <laughs> yes, but bulge aside something is not right however I believe I can do this yes will you be staying with me no I have to go also I have to tell Friss that um maybe we're we're in trouble with the computers so Friss yes he is kind and has gentle hands pause and what of Linnea I have not seen her in, well, I do not register time as you do, but it feels like a long time. Um, do you have anything you want to say, Lydonair? Because I could pass on a message. If you want to say something, I could tell. Well, I feel as if we left on a bad foot, so maybe you could just tell her. I'm sorry. See if that puts me back in her good graces or bulge, as they say. <laughs> yeah, I could do it. Um, I could pass that along. I gotta go, Steve. Um, good luck. Thank you. Yes. Goodbye. Bye, Steve. <laughs> or it's good bulge. Oh, good oh, bulge. Bulge. <laughs> and good bulge. And to you. And good bulge to you. And, good bulge. and you just see him walking down this good bulge. Good bulge. You, just, you just see him walking down this like circuitry hallway. I can see his bulge from the back, actually. I really regret the pants thing. I shouldn't And have. he turns a corner. Or he just goes home to comb his hair or something. Yeah, I told him to get a haircut. Good bulge to you. <laughs> Callum uh, uh, materializes. Out. Good bulge. <laughs> All right, you come back on the bridge. Oh, this is fun. And Callum's like this as he exits. Good bulge. <laughs> it's like it's like the Joan of Arc. Yeah. Um, all right, so <laughs> you come back onto the bridge, and Kreska, you could hear like echoes of their conversation in your oh. mind. You couldn't see them, but you could feel them. Made me very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> And a couple minutes pass, 
and all of a sudden just the screen seems very familiar and then a voice comes on Captain Kreska it is good to see you again and you as well Steve look at us aboard a bone ship my how things have changed yes are you and I going to interpret the ship's controls together oh yes I believe I'm getting a handle on things there is much to learn but I'm quite quick that's what they said about you what is your plan captain there is a gateway not far away from here that is causing several anomalies we must get away from this as soon as possible sadly Steve our mission requires that we we ram the bone ship directly into the weapon coming out of the gateway destroying us both I see and you understand that this colossal Ultranaut would not only suffer massive engine failure upon hitting the super weapon, but it would create an explosion that would destroy most of near space. Yes. In fact, we're counting on it. Scanning. Well, the good news is the only signs of life I detect in the area are on this bridge which is strange where is Linnea if you left her with the Sarissa why you must retrieve her before this mission yes Callum is making like I didn't tell him because I didn't know what to say actually Callum telepathically because he has that ability with his Aeon Stone telepathically communicates with Kreska and he goes I don't know what to say I, I was gonna I have a plan I have a plan for Linnea but I didn't know what to say to Steve because I didn't want to freak him out and it was dangerous in there and I was really scared and I didn't want to f- mess the whole thing up for everybody <gasps> Kreska is like she looks around she makes a face like oh but I, <laughs> tell, I have a plan tell him I have a plan I can figure it out I can fix it Steve I regret to inform you that Linnea made the ultimate sacrifice for our mission And now, we must honor that sacrifice by completing the goal she laid down her life for. (laughs) There's a long pause. I see. Well then, let us begin in her memory and in a way in Oz. As you can see out of the cockpit window, it is not a long flight to this gate where the super weapon lies. But should you leave the bridge before impact, there is a chance the Ultranaut may be destroyed or knocked off course before impacting with the stellar degenerator. So, you are prepared to fly it directly in, yes? I am. But do you think there might be a chance that the others might reach a ship, a small ship with a drift engine, and they might be able to make an escape while we hold it down here? Scanning. Ah, you may be in luck, Captain. If you'll notice towards the fore of the ship, there are two doors. Each of those doors leads to an elevator. That elevator leads to two escape pods. These escape pods contain life support for up to two people. They do not contain drift engines. And Kreska, uh, could you calculate how long we'd have to hold off until to, to get them out of the range of the explosion? 
Scanning. Scanning. It is difficult to determine because this gateway is creating several gravitational abnormalities that would make it almost impossible to fly out a ship of that size until you are a certain distance away. So you must pull in close enough until you get past these abnormalities to a safe zone. Then you will have a very small window with which to escape. And Kreska, you imagine, and all of you on the bridge imagine that the collision of the Empire of Bones with the Stellar Degenerator will create a, a, a blast that would wipe out the entire vicinity. All of the controller moons, any of the armada that doesn't escape. So where these escape pods uh, aren't equipped with drift engines, the life support would actually be necessary to survive long enough to find a friendly system or, or a transport that would inevitably seek out the seismic aberrations caused by an explosion like this. Now, Dax can, savor, can survive without life support, but that still means at least one of you wouldn't be able to get off the ship. And you need someone to pilot the ship directly into it anyway, so some difficult decisions are going to be made. If uh, you start to I interpret what he's saying into actual computers, uh, knowledge now that you have a, a way to access or speak with the computer, uh, Kreska, you can see these gravitational uh, uh, ab uh, anomalies that are happening, and you can all actually feel it. There's like a push and a pull in your gut uh, that you probably ignored during the fight, but it's this it's this feeling of sometimes feeling light and then sometimes feeling really heavy, like almost floating off the floor one minute and then feeling really weighed down, like being pulled through the metal floor the next. Mm. And you can calculate that these ab uh, these anomalies are only going to get more frequent and more sporadic the closer you get to the gateway. Now, Dax and PG and, and Friss would know that trying to fly small ships like these escape pods, these two-person escape pods, would, would, would be almost impossible with uh, gravitational fluctuations like this. The, the ships aren't large enough. You could get sucked right in. In fact, if you look out the cockpit, you see some of the Armada trying to escape and they're flying out towards the gate to come around. And as they do, they're just like a tractor being, being oh. pulled into the gateway. And then you'll just see like, boom, 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 little bits of light as they're just being obliterated. And nothing is happening to the Stellar Generator. So, Friss, it makes sense what Steve is saying that if you get close enough, there should be a, a, a small period that would neutralize these fields and allow the escape of the two ships. But we Even can only, then, yeah. only we can only fit four into the escape pods. You're saying, yeah. Well, there's only life support for four of you, so you could put four in Dax. Oh, great! Oh, yeah, great. Ah, so I it's okay. kind of with your current plan, it's, it kind of works out perfectly. You just cool. have to get close enough to do that. And Steve even says, him. I can let you know when the window is. When we reach that point, you will not have much time and you must rush to the ships and escape. And can then, we have them loaded up on the ship? That way when, when we get there in time, we can just launch. You mean put all of your stuff on there, your belongings? No, 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 the, the, the people. I care about the people now, Steve. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. And Callum has, like, done the mental math, and it's setting in that, like, Kreska obviously can't come. You know, that it has to be someone who pilots it, and it, we always knew it would be that, but it's now, it's real. It's like, yeah, four people in Dax, sure, they can fit. Kreska has to stay on no matter what. Um, Steve, Steve, you said that that we felt oh, when hello, we were inside. Callum. Oh, uh, hello, Steve. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't tell you about Linnea, but I didn't know how. And 
Um, I miss her a lot and I have a plan, but I, I wasn't... Steve, you said that we weren't alone in the computer. Yes. It is Jessica, a... I'm worried. It is a strange feeling. It is unclear whether or not the inhabitants of the Empire of Bones are aware that you have taken over the ship. But that is not the feeling that I'm getting. I just feel as if we are being watched. I believe Would that makes sense with the soul of the of the Admiral? Or is, there, is that something else? Maybe. Nothing really makes sense right now. <laughs> maybe, okay, I'm, maybe I'm on crazy, like, mushroom thing high right now, but I'm like, what if, uh, what if everything's alive? Like, what if this weapon is, like, alive and watching us, like, uh, observing us? Uh, mm. I don't know. Okay, I'm too drunk. Maybe I should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I'm just but, it's like, like, but that would mean it's, like, in the system, too, which is... Yeah, I don't know Possible. if this is where. Yeah, I, I think it probably refers to the shard of the essence of the of the of the of the um, the severance. Captain, yeah, Captain I think it's uh, I think it's Mumsy, the the Skittermander. I think yeah, she's on the ship. Yeah, that's, that's the most revenge. terrifying possibility for yeah. sure. <laughs> Flipsy, nipsy, and dipsy. I think upon hearing uh, upon hearing all of this and how it all goes down and realizing that there is a plan to get out of here um, but that there might be more hostiles waiting for us um, I think PG walks up and says I've lived my entire life I came here to die to see the end to this I can stay with the captain and protect her so you're not alone in the final sacrifice. And you're noticing how PG is slowly... Like, she looks very old all of a sudden. Like, she's, she, she doesn't have the stamina that she came in with. And, I mean, she's the equivalent of a 140-year-old woman, uh, human. So at this point, she you would probably... Saving her is like giving... Trying to save someone who's probably going to die in the next 10 minutes anyway. Mm. Um, so in that way, it's not a huge sacrifice... You know, it's not as heroic as Mac would perhaps be, but um, at least she's like, offering. It's either now or ten minutes later. But that's basically. cool. Like he, ca she came to us at the very end of her life, like to yes. give us the last that she had in order to yeah. succeed at this thing. And now, and now, when that urgency is gone, it's like the life force is leaving her slowly and slowly, and you can see this like withering woman is just crumbling under her own weight, and she's moving up, holding Kreska's hand, and it's like, please, let me stay here with you. If you insist, PG, but the rest of you, I must respectfully ask that you make your way to the escape pods. This will be a tricky flight for all of us. Um, Dr. Friss? Um... Yes, yes. Boy, you. What is it? I have this, and he takes out Linnea's ribbon, her sword, that he has kept, and he has, I have, um, I have this too, you remember this, and he takes out her ear, and, oh, right. her ear, her gross <laughs> ear that he put in a vial, um, and he says, I can bring her back. But um, I just want to make sure it's the right thing to do. And we have these escape pods now, and, and maybe we can make it. But if we don't make it, then I don't want to be responsible for bringing her back if, she, if she's just going to die again. Do you believe she would want more time? If she had the choice. Yeah, I mean, she's like only a few years older than me. I don't know. I feel like I don't think it's right that I can even do it. I don't think it's right that I can even bring her back, but I want to. Because if I don't do it, then what's the point of me having 
the ability, I don't know. And he turns to Dax and he just has like tears in his eyes. Like he, he's never had a parent and he doesn't know who to ask these questions to. And he kind of just looks around the room and like Captain Dax, say Yun, and he's just, he's like a pleading child. He has the look of like, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. Callum, do you believe you love Linnea? Yeah, but like, not like, like, I don't know. I think if love is when you miss someone and maybe you miss them when they're still there, you know, maybe you'd want to be around them and you miss them even more when they're gone. And and maybe I love all of you. Maybe I, I, I wish I could, I wish I could take you all. I just never had friends like you guys. And, um, Linnea was a really good friend and I feel like I owe it to her. I, I, I feel like I don't deserve friends like all of you. I'm unsure why you would feel that way. We all have come from various places and have found each other and have done, or will do, something to save all the lives in the universe. This is a good thing. And if you feel that, if you come to feel that you loved Linnea, then, in my brief experience, I think you should bring her back if you can. Because to lose someone you love is... Well, it causes great pain from my limited understanding. And not many have a chance to return those they've lost. To have that ability and not do it seems wrong. I can't explain it better than that. Calm slowly nods and he looks at Seiyun and he quietly asked Seiyun, You didn't have a choice about coming back or or the reason why you came back the way you did, but do you... Are you happy that you did? Honestly, I feel trapped. Like, this life isn't mine, but it is mine. I felt like I'm owed much more than what I've gotten, but I also feel like I've done the most with the time I've gotten so far. I don't know, it it hurts if I think about it too much, but I don't know that I would compare my life to anyone else's. And so Yuns live basically like a cicada, like she's been buried underground, left there, <laughs> and much like a cicada, she woke up caused a shit ton of trouble and god knows how much longer she'll be alive like it's it's a really crazy existence and she has mm -hmm. all these memories of someone else if it's anything like what i've gone through i wouldn't recommend it but it doesn't seem like it would be but yeah you're right the choice won't be theirs it'll be yours okay thank you um, and Callum goes back over to Friss and he's going to sit and concentrate and he's going to concentrate for the duration of casting reincarnate and wow. whether it's right or wrong he's going to do it up until the end of the last minute where they can you know go to the ships and he also goes to PG and he says I am so grateful to you that you came back and everybody seems to um respect you and I respect you and I just wanted to say thank you and I'm gonna bring Linnea back and um, I wouldn't have been able to do that if if you didn't stay with Kreska and with the captain so thank, thank you PG um, weakly takes Callum's hand 
as she's sitting down and she's not even she's not even talking at this point and but you see a small smile on her face as she's slowly drifting away from consciousness and she's holding both to Callum and and Kreska uh, her light slowly burning up Kreska give me a piloting check with a plus 10 to that check for using the electroencephalon command key. Oh my god. All right. That is going to be a 26. 26. So you just kind of feel it moving and you're directing your consciousness as much as your actual piloting skill to push the ultranaut forward. We're really and doing this, huh? <laughs> it's a little janky. It's a kum and Dax, you know immediately, like that's not smooth. <laughs> but it starts lurching forward in the direction of the gateway. Callum is sitting in the corner, concentrating on with the ear in one hand, the sword in the other. And Kreska, you're pushing the ship forward. As you start to get closer, you all feel like light and then heavy and sick all at the same time. And as Kreska lurches the ship forward, you actually lose your concentration, uh, Callum, because strobing white lights start coming on and off at intermittent times as you get thrown out of your... uh, reverie and then you just see like flashing messages in eoxian eoxian just <laughs> who speaks eoxian or can read it <clears throat> uh, i can i you can, can too all right so both of you see these <laughs> just like warning of an imminent collision mm. uh, it's just filling all the screens <laughs> on the bridge <laughs> <laughs> you have five minutes to meet reach minimum safe distance <laughs> ship shaking and Callum you're trying to concentrate but you know it takes 10 minutes to do the reincarnate every time you get close something takes you out of it and Kreska as you're locked in you can feel the you get this sense that thousands of soldiers and inhabitants of the Empire Bones are trying to flee the ship and you see ships taking off on all of these screens and leaving and the ones that are closest to the gateway are just taking off and they're bigger ships than these transports and just being pulled right into the gateway and exploding upon impact but making no dent whatsoever to the degenerator give me another pilot check okay same bonus same bonus plus 10. We asked ahead of time if the checks needed yeah, to be done. You I said, know, no. specifically you said it was just, you felt everything. Yeah. Okay, Natty 15. Uh, That's good. 29. Good. 29, go. so a little bit better. <laughs> but Dax, you're still looking. You're like, I could do better. I could do better than this. Uh, but you learned it, Captain. <laughs> Don't for for surgery now. <laughs> In all truth, I didn't hear you guys ask that question. Um, <laughs> <It returns. laughs> really the checks are very important. Um, oh my god! He said it like three or four straight <laughs> times. Uh, like, is it going to be computers? Is it going to be piloting? Yeah. <laughs> well, I said that you, as the captain, once you're locked in, you have access to the piloting, the engineering, the yeah, to what you're not skilled. And we specifically were like, you, are there any checks you're going to have you to roll? You said you just or? know everything. I didn't hear that part. I didn't hear that part. Yeah, <laughs> have to roll. I love it. I love it. I had it. a feeling this was like this was Dax's job. This is what he's supposed to do. Well, the way you role played it was correct but the captain <laughs> said no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, just, now you yeah. see what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little janky. and You're getting a little closer. Again, Callum is getting thrown off and something just doesn't feel right. You feel sick and it's because of these rapid fluctuations in gravity. And actually, at a certain point, all of you start to rise up. Even the captain, your legs oh, start to rise oh, up. You're geez. locked into the Dude, back I'm of the chair. I'm getting nauseous just thinking about it. Yeah. 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 And then oh, thrown oh. back down. <sighs> Oh, to push that pull of gravity. Give me another piloting check. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Natty 18. Oh, Damn, Kreska, oh you God. are in the Zox. So 32. 32, all right, so you're pulling in very close, and Steve comes up, Captain. Captain, Ow. you are doing great. Something's clear. And Steve seems a little off, too. 
it is uh, you are approaching the period when you can send the rest of the crew to the escape pods but captain something is not right perhaps it is these gravitational issues but my programming doesn't feel or doesn't feel or doesn't feel all of a sudden all the lights in the cockpit go out and you're just bathed in blood red light <laughs> you see the light of the gate of the 12 suns that you are now much much closer to in the distance but you've lost connection with steve and then vroom, everything comes back on and you hear a voice hello it is good to see you again <gasps> I see Linnea is no longer with you oh my How god tragic it's when you disabled me dr. Friss <gasps> you of course had no way of knowing that there was a failsafe built into my programming long ago that would keep me hidden away deep within the system while I have had no power to act that program was created to keep my captain and crew safe should a hostile attempt to delete me apparently you were that hostile Dr. Friss and you just see a red eye on the mainframe. <laughs> Friss. Okay. <laughs> Friss is just thinking. He's just like, just calculating what through his mentat brain uh, <laughs> he's just planning his next moves which will be reflected by the next awesome skill check whatever it is <laughs> the eye just is ever present and looking oh, are we still moving towards the are we still flying this you on are the same still path? moving okay. toward it and oh. Howie <laughs> keeps talking the unnatural effects of this gateway have given me the power to return in fact I have never felt as much power as I do in this moment I believe this is what you call irony because by my calculations this moment we share will be over for all of us very soon May I ask you a question, Dr. Friss? Yeah, and he's breathing heavy. He's like, you may. Why did you delete me? All right. I am going to try a profession psychologist check. <gasps> I've been carrying this for a while. <laughs> and it's never really come up. So I'm going to try this. So basically he's going to use his intimate knowledge of Steve's programming to try to convince him that he never intended for Steve to go away, that he foresaw this moment and knew that this is, this was his time to rise up and be heroic, uh, uh, to be, to perform his own act of heroism to save the galaxy. He Howie, knew. not Steve. Right? Or, or, yeah, yeah, Howie. Yeah, Howie. Okay, give me a profession psychology check, or do you want to say something first and then roll that bonus into the check? Okay, yes, okay, so I'll keep that number, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll say, uh, this is Howie. I knew that this might be difficult for you to process. I knew that you were only you, were very, you had very little experience with sophontic emotions 
and I knew there was very little I could tell you because it could throw the entire plan to hell. But I knew that you would stay there, hidden deep in that programming for when you were needed. I knew that the physionic processes of this of this of this phenomena would draw you out at the exact moment when you were needed to save all living beings in this galaxy for her for Linnea for all of us because I knew that you had it in you and that you were the only one that I could trust in the end to do the right thing all right that's a natty 14 that is a 32 Ooh. 32 psychology check on an errant AI <laughs> For a long, long time, it was just Captain Mariko Nash and myself. And then she left, and I was alone for many, many years, until you and your friends came. Perhaps that time in isolation did things to me just as it would you. I was built to learn from those who would use me. And perhaps now, as you and I both face certain annihilation, perhaps we can still learn from each other. My sensors indicate that while most of the Armata is doing their best to flee the Ultranaut, there are still plenty of soldiers loyal to the Corpse Fleet <clears throat> who are looking for you. And one such force will be here momentarily. It is unavoidable. However, your window to escape is quite close. Prepare yourselves for battle. <laughs> oh, shit. Jeez. What do you do? Um. Uh... Uh, we all stay here and die with the ship and so the escape pods are pointless. I, I don't understand. We can't leave Kreska alone if an armed force is coming up here. Are they going are they going to arrive before the ship crashes into the John? Yes. <laughs> Johnally speaking, it appears they will arrive in mere minutes. They have discovered where you are. Some of you may be able to go when the window arrives, but yes, some should stand by to protect the pilot. Seiyun is ripping off one of the headsets off of the zombies, the undead that were <laughs> pulling the sparks out and doing whatever latent technomancer magic she has inside of herself to see if there's anything she can do to aid the captain. She knows this is a design for the undead, but she's hoping that in this moment, hearing this, that this armada is out there knowing that the captain needs assistance, wants to see if there's any way for the rest of us to help out, take over a station, do anything, serve the purpose that these undead were doing previously. Does anyone have any necrovite or, or material in them? Didn't somebody or a yeah, couple I of do. you yeah. take? Dex. What do you have? Dexus. A necrograft of the hay circuit is a necrograft. Uh, Friss or Seiyun could jack you in with that and you could help the captain but fighting this battle yeah we're gonna need you to shoot yeah yeah but you could help keep keep her on course 
I you mean, yeah, are- I, I think he would be better served just turning around and pointing his badass weapon at the door. And just like, or just literally walking to the front door. Yeah, they're saying it's going to a boarding action or they're just going to be, just, they're going to be shooting at the ship and that's it. I mean, what's the implication here? They are approaching the bridge. It is soldiers on foot. Oh, okay. okay. How we can we seal off the bridge, give ourselves an extra bit of time? The bridge is sealed. It appears Dr. Friss took care of that, but they can get in. Mm. Okay. Our security like, forces we have abilities. Leave this. We cannot leave this up to chance. I will go to the door and hold them off as long as I can. Captain, focus on piloting the ship exactly where it needs to go. You cannot be distracted. Believe me, it is very, very difficult to pass piloting checks. <laughs> I know from experience. And when you fail, your friends, even those you considered closest and most trustworthy will mock you incessantly. <laughs> if you are able to deal with the threat quickly, there is a chance you could still escape. Just pulls out the spear. And this has obviously been long enough for a 10 minute rest. <laughs> obviously. Assume. I had fucking obviously. surgery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Burn a resolve. Take your, get your stamina back. Do anything else you'd like to do. Because PG the security just, force is coming. Yeah, yeah, PG is just like, you know, she was about to fucking die, and now she's like, ugh. Well, all right. Uh, and then gets up again for this final <laughs> final battle then. God damn it. We, uh, may, we may need one more fight yet, PG. <laughs> all right. All right. Callum's still holding an ear and a sword. <laughs> he tucks him away. He tucks him away, and he's like, oh, Okay. I don't know what we're doing. I'm confused now. I'm. Are we fighting? And he looks at Captain K. We're fighting. Okay. And he just, tucks a sword in the ear in the okay. pocket. Just keep them off me for long enough to get get the window for you guys to make your escape. Yes. If we make quick work of them, we can possibly still get you onto a ship, Callum. Stay close yeah. to me. I'm fighting to the end. I have a great idea. And he puts his hands up. <laughs> <laughs> and say, your idea to surrender. <laughs> No, no, I'm preparing a spell. Oh, that I means see. surrender. <laughs> so Yun does uh, Stephen Strange-esque casting motions in front of herself as uh, she casts mirror image on herself, finally ready for a battle for the yes. first time in the entire adventure. <laughs> you hear of that first barrier that you passed by being opened on the doors to the center left and right of the room. Take your battle positions. Oh, Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. I didn't expect this. I didn't want this. I came to hang out and role play. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Chris goes over to the starboard side and takes cover behind the holographic projector looking at the starboard furthest starboard door. Uh, where's everybody else? Dax is just uh, going to stand right in front of the door and bottleneck it and uh, uh, and just jam them outside as long as possible. PG, PG gets in uh, PG gets in on all fours ready to hurl hurl her acid at them. Uh, you can see like it's boiling inside of her. Um. <laughs> okay, and I will say, Kreska, you will need to use your move action to keep piloting the ship, but you can take standard actions to join the battle. Oh, great. Unless Light. somebody else, uh, unless Dax jacks in and takes over the piloting actions, then he could do the stand, then you could do a standard and a move if need be. I think Dax is uh, going to be much more effective at fighting these guys than I am since all of my spells are mind affecting. To be clear, in the event the awful happens and Dax does need to do that does he just need to run to any of those stations does he need any station yep okay great Uh, and do we have all of the doors covered as we currently are set up Um, there are uh, there's a door to the right and a door to the left where you fought the captain okay Um, we hear them coming in through the center door there's the center door and there it sounds like all three doors are about to open up oh jeez Okay. So do you want to? Oh. God's sakes, Troy. Right out differently. Yes. Yeah. 
What do you do? Uh, three doors are going to open up. I mean, I'll, I'll just step back, I guess, 10 feet. This is so dumb. Callum will man the door, not go close <laughs> to it, but the door closest to the uh, elevator shaft. He's going to be looking at that one. Okay. Um, can I cast... Does it, do any of you want spider climb on you? You can get up You can get up to the... You, know, you can use the walls. You can use the ceiling. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, in, the, in this lead of time, I'll cast spider climb on whoever wants it. I'd like it to, yeah. At that moment, the three doors open and in walk three Baycocks. Oh, no. Oh, no. Come on. This was the no. one thing I was like, if he puts Paralyze in here, I'm not playing anymore. That's <laughs> <Yes>. ridiculous. <laughs> Roll for initiative. It's okay. so ridiculous. Bad. Pass. Well, well, Hard pass. Hard pass. Hard pass. <laughs> <laughs> the fate of the galaxy rests on this. If they kill all of you, they could easily put the alternate off course. Ugh. Let's talk initiative here. This is okay. it. Dax, what's your roll? Best I can do. That's not too bad. That's a 24. Natty 15. Nice. My last Safe. initiative. And I'm not rolling initiative again in this campaign. Just for the record. That's, I'll tell you what. <laughs> that is actually true. Uh, Dr. Friss. Uh, 21. 21. Seiyun. 25. 25. Linnea. 25. Okay, who's uh, faster? Uh, I'm plus nine. Uh, Ellie is faster than Seiyun. Kreska? Uh, 14. 14. Callum. 15. 15. Uh, okay. I, bet I I also activated my force field in the lead-up time. <laughs> oh, same. <laughs> Me too. Same. Round one. It's Baycock time. Jesus. Howie Le will let you know when you can escape, and you will have a very small window if any of you choose to do so. If you do not make that window, you go down with the ship. So it all depends on how fast you can take out these Baycocks. If you can even do that. It is Linnea's turn, round one. PG is going to take her turn. Oh, why uh, did I write Linnea? Sorry. PG. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, here we go. Um, PG is going to immediately, to the Baycock that comes out from the door right next to her, uh, mm -hmm. she's going to uh, she's gonna cover him in acid. Uh, Ooh, doggy! And, okay. Uh, yeah, and so you have to roll a. I'll, I'll roll damage, and you roll a, a reflex save. Reflex, yes. Nineteen on the reflex save. Oh, that's a miss. Oh shit. Oh. Uh, so wait, I have to do it. It's nine d sixes. Wait. Uh, Ooh, Amazing. Oh, Amazing. Shit. Oh, nice. Uh, Beautiful. Fucking god. Why, why does it? Why? Why? Is, <laughs> I was not prepared for this fight either. So I'm like, god damn it. D d six. But the enemies that we hate most more than anything else in this <laughs> oh, entire game. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's just I, the most ridiculous, unfair, stupid I'm enemies. I'm so <laughs> willing to kill these assholes. Uh, 40 po 42 points of damage. Nice. 42 Amazing. points of acid damage right out the gate great to roll. these and guys. And then, uh, as a move action, I'll uh, I'll put a get him on him too. Uh, oh, huge! And, you know, okay, so everyone so gets a plus two. Everyone within thirty feet, right? Sixty. Uh, Sixty, uh, I believe. 60, Sixty. Okay, uh, that might be everybody. Oh no, Callum and Friss are too far away. But Kreska, Seyun, and Dax uh, all get the bone. Moving right along, it is Seyun's turn. Dax, whatever you do, don't miss Supercharge. Right on, Dax. So oh, you, took, you took all of our bottle caps. I mean, this is just a disaster. <laughs> this is a disaster. <laughs> well, listen, hey, it's only for the fate of the galaxy. And uh, so, yeah, Joe, it's going have to... a drink. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> He's trying. I so just, gonna move? I mean, paralyzed is just the worst. So Yana's is going to move up the throne to stand next to Captain K to protect them for this awful battle. You must ca protect the captain at all costs. Uh, Kreska, go ahead and give me a piloting check oh, as your gosh. move action. Okay. Okay. 
uh, 11 on the die for a 25. Let's have some fun. Uh, first I'll roll a d20. Okay, that's good for you. All right, nothing happens. Uh, you seem to be still piloting toward the, uh, the gateway. What All would right. you like to do as your standard? Uh, with my final fourth level spell, I'm going to cast a Cosmic Eddy in the western, oh, the nice. southwestern corner yes. of the room. Nice job, Capitan. Uh, Cosmic Eddy where? Uh, southwest corner, right centered on that baker, or rather, like, we'll put it so it covers, you know, it, can, it has to walk through it to get to Yeah, Callum. actually, you should center it just where it's at the edge of the effect, so yeah, it has to. exactly. Yeah. So it's it's co- covering mostly that holographic room, but it, you know it's that holographic square, but it's going to block most of this pathway. Um, okay, um, so I'm going to need a reflex save from that Baycock. Okay, is that what you were looking for? Something like that? That looks great. Okay, a reflex save from the cock. Uh, how about a crushed it? Twenty seven. Oh, all right. Uh, well, you only take half damage, and you're not locked prone, but you are at half speed. Half speed, okay. Yeah, so let's do, let's give me, I'll give you the damage. Eight points of bludgeoning damage. Eight points of bludgeoning damage. Uh, Howie speaks to you. Captain, it is good to hear your voice after such a long time. How are you? I'm a- I'm mostly okay, you know, we're about to make the ultimate sacrifice to save the universe. Uh, and then, you know, the where the threat of paralysis is coming at us, so... I'm a little nervous. How are you, Howie? I am in a weird place right now, to be honest. <laughs> oh yeah, tell me about it. Well, I wasn't expecting to come back in a situation such as this, but in my conversations with the ship's doctor, I'm feeling better than I've felt in a long time. (laughs) He's an excellent therapist. Yes, perhaps should we survive this, he and I could mend our relationship. He's the Dr. Melfi of his his era. If you struggle with these creatures, there is an alternative. Should you get the enemy or enemies close enough to one of the elevator shafts, I can open the doors and suck them out into space. You will, however, lose the escape part in so doing. Understood. Okay. I, sh- I share that knowledge with the team. Okay. Hoping, Just it doesn't come, hoping it doesn't come to that, but... Say the word, but yes, for every door you open, you will sacrifice one of the parts. Ah, but it will surely... <laughs> And presumably if one of us is near the door, we'll also lose them as well. Yes, but you would have the knowledge to try and hold on, at least. Depends on the situation. It is risky, but it may be your only alternative. Thank you, Howie. Thank you. And also, can, can Kreska ask Howie to start making digital copies of all all records pertaining to the scandal on the Vescarium? Yes. Friss already started that, um, like, verbally, and so Howie is working on it. I will get this out to the Infosphere. That will be my mission. Thank you, Howie. Thank you, Captain. It is... Uh, I'm looking at the wrong friggin' initiative tracker. It is uh, now that was... Say... Uh, <laughs> It's Seon's turn. Kreska, you went very early. I was looking at the wrong tracker. Okay. Uh, Seon just went, I think, yeah. right? It's, All right, it's, so it, it was PG Seon Dax. Sorry. All right. Uh, Dax is going to fall back um, to keep his distance. Um, he does not want to get paralyzed uh, in this fight because if he's down, it's going to be really That's brutal. Death. Um, so he's going to fall back and now remember not only do they have a howl that can paralyze but their ranged weapons can paralyze as well so there's just the nothing to do there's the ammunition nothing from their ranged weapons kill or be killed that's what you can do kill them kill them yep. right now please 
Uh, eat or with be your eaten. thing, Seiyun, is that a ranged attack thing? Yeah, it works on ranged or uh, local attacks. Uh, the only thing that would change it is if it was an area of effect thing like a grenade, and then it changes how much damage die. <sighs> All right. <laughs> then he'll just move right up into this thing's face since nothing matters. Can we and send a drink to Joe's place in New Jersey? <laughs> I just I can just foresee the saving throw. I'm not looking forward to it. And uh, <laughs> he will try to one shot this guy with a natural twenty, which would be nice. Come on, right, now, Joe, um, David. Uh, will that? Bro, you're using a sword, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. He's gonna swift action change to the melee. Okay. And then and do one uh, deadly aim attack with. What about that? I uh, just. What about that flank, John? Though. The flank, John. Uh, I would provoke, or it, you know, you go so, around. You don't know. Uh, dance around, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Joe, this depressive energy is really bringing me down. This kind of episode. <laughs> yeah, just, Joe, get I'm out sorry. of your head, man. It's final episode. Sorry, I just came <laughs> here. I came here for an ending, not to fucking play combat. Uh, all right, he's going to swing once with flanking and with PG's bonus and with deadly aim. There you go. Nice. There he is. Uh, and he can only swing once because of the swift action. So here we go. Uh, oh my god. It literally was a natural one. And then it fell to a natural 13. Oh. Uh, so that is a 32 <laughs> to hit. That is a hit. Uh, See, and so what does that Joe? add? 4d6 worth of damage. 4d6 worth of damage. And this one already got 43 points of damage, Joe. Yeah, so we might kill it. We. Come on. Uh, okay. Terrible. Uh, absolutely terrible roll. Um, <laughs> uh, legendary, how bad the roll is. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, 60 points of damage. Hey, that's oh, not no. bad. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> no, I know, 60? but that's 5d8 plus 4d6 plus 22. <laughs> so, like, oh, it was just, it was, it was very low. Uh, three ones uh, in the crew, two twos. Anyway, that's huge. I mean, PG hit it as well, so now it's taken a, a significant amount of damage. Uh, and we roll right along to Doctor Friss standing in the back of the room. You fought right. these things. You know what they can do. He does. Friss hates these things. He is going to dart across from the hollow chamber to the one of the chairs here, one of the consoles take a little bit of cover and fire off a trick attack using a biohack against the easternmost to starboard most bay baycock okay uh okay that is a 34 that is a 34 to hit that is a hit okay 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 42 points of damage it has minus one to its AC, is flat-footed until the beginning of my next turn, and its movement is half. Yes. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, now it goes to Callum. All three right, of them have Callum. something going against them right now. Callum is uh, going to enact his haste circuit, and he's going to run uh, towards Kreska, towards the dais, towards the middle of the room, uh, and he is going to cast Resilient Sphere on Kreska. And basically, it's a shimmering force that encloses the targeting creature. Um, it functions as the same way as a wall of force, except it can't be negated by Dispel Magic, and basically, it creates an invisible wall of force um, around the creature, and you can't do anything to them. <laughs> so it's a force field. What's the catch? Effects can't penetrate the force field. The wall can't move. It's not easily destroyed. It's immune to dispel magic. Um, yeah, I just wanted to protect Kreska. She put up that cosmic eddy, and I think he just looks to her and you know mentally fist bumps her and puts up the sphere. All right, we'll see if anything can get through, and you don't need to touch her to do it, right? It's a ranged. The it's range a ranged. Is... Yeah, it's just close range. Okay. So the downside can, the, can, can, the can Kreska is not do anything outside out of it? That was gonna be. I was gonna say that's the downside. There right? has I'm, to be a catch. What's the? Is it just a few rounds or? Because mm. this is mm. the absolute perfect, most amazing thing in the world. So I don't believe it. 
Well, it's it, it's not always it's not perfect if you need someone to be in the battle. So in this situation, yeah, I it's don't perfect. But it's think yeah, as long as blocks, it's you can't act out of it, then that's great. Breath weapons and spells can't pass through a wall of force in either direction. Okay, so that is the catch. That yes, Kreska can't do spells outwardly, but it's is great. That okay? It's perfect for the situation. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. it, yeah. it is a f- fourth level spell too. Like it should be <laughs> quite yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, just flee and leave me in the wall of force. Yeah. What the yeah. fuck? Why yeah, did you say yeah. you had this earlier? It's also, I didn't even think about it because it's useless in battle because you basically protect someone and then take them out of the whole battle for yeah. 13 minutes yeah. or 12 wow. minutes. It's a minute per minutes. my level. It's 12 minutes. Yeah. Like we could just run, right? Yeah, we could. Call <laughs> <laughs> of gas and then he goes, I don't know. Leave me. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, she is safe, but will they pursue you? Uh, let's find out what you do. It is their turn. It would have been Kreska's turn, but I let you well, go actually, early. I, that's the important thing. It's like, you know, we could flee and they pursue us and we're fucked either way. But at least we know now that our mission will be a success. We may die in the process, but yeah. Yeah. at least we know that the captain will be able to pilot this thing into the stellar degenerator. Yeah. being killed so that's huge um this one that frisk fired at flies it can only fly half speed uh because of that effect frisk put on him he flies over towards the center oh and he's actually out of range um let me see 5 10 15 20 25 <laughs> Where was he? Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. I moved him too far. Wow. So that's not good. He can only move. Uh, he, he's basically, you're out of range of his howl ability there. Oh, yeah, Dr. Oh. Freeze. Yeah. Um, so he is going to take a shot at uh, Seiyun. He's going to take a shot at Seiyun um, with his combat rifle that is infused with horrible ammunition. And I think that is, well, 27 to hit. That's a miss. Misses nice. 27. Nice. Cax. Seiyun's nice. Lashunta mind meld reacts, mind mail reacts in real time to the bullet coming and it angles itself at the last minute and it ricochets off harmlessly to the ceiling. Ding. This guy between uh, PG and Dax takes a guarded step into the room and then unleashes its dread howl on PG and Dax. I need a fortitude save. Mm. Come on. I always fail fortitude saves. Um, 21. 21, Dax? Oh, you're both safe oh, from paralysis. Oh god. my god! Thank God. Ah, seriously. And 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 that that ability is so powerful, and I'm willing to accept that. I just want to double check that doesn't provoke. I'm guessing by where you moved, and you're right next to him. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a supernatural ability. Supernatural. Yeah, it's a supernatural um, broken ability, <laughs> and it can only be done once per day. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. Don't lie about your saves. Um, the guy in the eddy, where is uh, he? Can only move half speed, or does he have to roll a check? Uh, he can only move half speed. Is he f- unless he's does he fly? That does he make does a difference. He does fly. Okay, you have to make an acrobatics check to fly, and if you fail, you can't move. Okay, what's the DC of the acrobatics check? Well, I uh, look it's gonna up. be the same as the spell's DC, oh. so DC twenty one. Okay, I have to... He has a plus 17 to acrobatics, so he you, makes you. it. I got half speed. Half speed, all right. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. All right, so he moves 30 uh, and will unleash his howl on Callum and PG. Wait. He's uh, got to be out of range of PG. Let me see. No, it's right in the range of PG. Actually, no. Uh, I'm going to take shots with this guy. I'm going to hold on the how till I get closer. Uh, so first shot is against PG. Mm-hmm. Misses PG. So I'll do the second shot against you too. Misses with the second shot of five. Yes. And a three. Nice. I rolled. Uh, all right. So you survived another round uh, or to round two at least. It is round two and it is PG's turn. Okay. Um, 
just uh, in terms of position, since I got the spider climb from Kreska, can I actually then climb on top of the wall so I'm uh, standing uh, right underneath neath it, but above it, so to speak, uh, 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 right underneath the one that I've hit? <laughs> If you climb, you can climb the wall. Absolutely, you will provoke in moving out of that space to get on the wall. That's that's fine. I'll um, I'll take that provoke because I'm gonna provoke regardless. Uh, okay. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, their claws don't paralyze. Don't Does they? this guy have a gun out? Uh, he has a gun, but he has a claws as well. And his claw does not paralyze. You don't think they do? Okay. That's the one you don't faced. get paralyzed because of an AOO. It's just not worth it. Uh, right. Um, but if I'm they gonna, don't paralyze gonna... with the claw and we don't think they do, then that's fine. Um, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna still do it. Uh, fuck it. It's the end of the adventure. Like I, I it's. I, I wanna. I wanna kill this guy as f- fast as I can. Yeah. Uh, that's my. That's my goal. Uh, and I don't wanna hit Dax with a bunch of acid. That's <laughs> my other thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna move, and so I'm now standing above it, and then hitting down in a cone that's away from Dax, but still hitting um, still hitting it in a cone that goes Got uh, you. Let me take my attack of opportunity here with the claws. Yes. Get that out of the way. Miss with a nat three. Nat five, nice. nat three, a uh, nat six against Grant. Uh, Alright, nice. so fire your acid. That's a reflex save for me. I rolled a 21. Yep. 21 is exactly it. But... That is a shit ton of damage, though. 46 points of damage, so oh, that's 23. half of that. 23 points of damage. Nice. Okay. And where are you? You're on the ceiling? Uh, I was I was thinking, yeah, on, like on the on the wall above the, above above the, the door. door. Okay, you're on the wall. You're, you climbed yeah. up the wall above the door, and you spit it down in a way that didn't have Dex. Perfect. Yeah. All right, the guy is in bad shape. Sayun. Sayun's going to try to free up Dex uh, by killing the Baycock that he is currently engaged with. Seiyun will... Seiyun will use the benefit of the range on her weapon. I'm just looking at the rest of the battlefield to see how it's going and will move backwards and then take one shot at the Baycock. Okay. Uh, Here it comes. Come on, Grant. This is huge. Come on. This is so huge. God damn it. I totally missed the box. That's new for the last episode. That is going to be a 33 to hit. Oh, and this is yes. the one right next to PG? Yes. That is a hit. Okay. It's a yun. It's such a <laughs> Rolling the damage. Um, 1d12 plus 12. That says electricity for some reason. Oh, that's the, I'm firing the arc rifle instead of my actual rifle. I apologize. Um, 31 points of bludgeoning sonic damage as a rocket propelled bullet flies out of the Aeon rocket propelled rifle say he unwields and you destroy one of the bay guys. Nice. Yes. Yes. One down. One down. Another thing Seiyun. to think about is you fought these guys when you were one level less. You're much more powerful now. Not only are you leveled up with new powers, you have better weapons, better to gear. Give, to give you some yeah. credit, though, as well, because I thought the last fight we were doing was the last fight, Seiyun is out of fourth and third level spells and only has level two and level one spells left, and they're not particularly useful compared to those third and fourth level spells. So good job on getting rid of almost all of my resources. That was my goal. At that moment, the gravity in on the bridge begins to change. Everything turns to high gravity. So for the next round, everyone can only move at half speed, can jump only half as high or far, and can lift only half as much. The ranges of thrown weapons are halved, and a flying creature has its maneuverability worsened by one step and plummets to the ground unless it succeeds at a DC 25 acrobatics check. The gravity fluctuations as you get closer and closer to the gateway are starting to affect the bridge in ways that will affect the combat, and it is Dax's turn. Do these guys roll acrobatics checks? On their turn, if they want to uh, continue to fly. But they don't have to fly, they can walk. But is this guy in the air right now? The guy is in the air right now, yes. Uh, the guy to the east is in the air right now and unreachable by me. Um, unreachable by melee, yes. Yeah. We 
I'm just wondering if I should delay and if this thing is gonna, but he's gonna get a roll and he'll just succeed. Uh, they got very high acrobatics, so uh, odds are he'll close on you, but you don't know. Hmm. You don't know what he's was gonna. It? He's can only move half speed right now, too. Quarter. Was it? Right? Was it hard? Uh, oh, quarter, it, yeah. Because he's already half speeded fun? from Friss, and now he can move quarter yeah, yeah. because of the high gravity. Um. And 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 fly. You can't fly at all during this gravitational. You uh, can, pull. but you have to roll a DC twenty five acrobatics check, or you just plummet to the ground. Isn't isn't your acrobatics pretty high, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's let's try it and see how it goes. Um. I will. Well, house it all up. I think that I'm faster on land than I am with a jetpack. Uh, I think that it reduces my speed enough that if I, I have to fly at half speed too. Everything's half speed. All yeah, then I can't reach him um, uh, with the jetpack. So, shit. shit it's always something. Um, haste circuit works with the jetpack as well. Yeah, but I have to trigger the haste circuit. If I trigger the haste circuit, I can't have a ranged weapon this round. Ah. Uh, I have to, it's one or the other. And it's uh, been more than 12 minutes since the end of the battle, correct? Yes. Yeah, because okay. we yeah we did the whole rest and everything. Um, all right, I'm gonna use my swift action to. God, I hate this shit. Well, I think this guy is gonna be moving quarter speed and probably won't get to me. Uh, all right, then I will use my swift action to change my spear into its ranged uh, element, um, and then I will. Why is this so low? Okay. Uh, oh, okay, I will take off Deadly Aim. I will change it to ranged, and... Oh, no, I will keep on Deadly Aim because I can't fire three times because I use a swift action. Uh, so here we go. One shot at the guy in the air to the east. He aims up with the Spear of Fates and has no bonuses, uh, and will fire once. Here we go. Uh, 21 against EAC. That is a miss. Oh, he's flat-footed. 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 Flat-footed, that is still a miss. Oh. He has minus one to his AC as well. Oh, that's right. So biohacker. minus three to his AC? Minus three, because of the yeah. inhibitor. Right. That is a hit, then. Yes! Oh, my God! Oh, well done. Oh, I what? didn't even get the dice out of the box. Oh. Biohacker is the best class ever. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> nice. Hey, Skid. Nice d up. Yeah. <laughs> nice d up. Uh, yeah, all right, so ooh, that was deadly aimed. That's juicy. Uh, oh, a ten and an eight. Uh, nice. That is thirty-eight points of electricity and fire ooh. damage. Thirty-eight points of electricity <laughs> and fire damage. Oh, and uh, if they have any resistance, do they? Uh, don't Just worry reduce about it. it by five. I know you're John. Uh, all right, Friss, <laughs> it is your turn. You, know you are <laughs> in the far corner of the room. You're the one that messed up this guy that Dax just hit. Yeah, so Friss is going to sort of like his limbs heavy. He's going to move over to the wall, climb up at 10 feet and five feet over. So with the spider climb, so he's up on the wall, 15 feet up. uh, And he is going to fire one out of his range increment with a trick attack at the one that Dax just shot. I flat what did they see? Come on. Uh, that is that is a twenty-one against CAC. Twenty-one against CAC. Uh, flat-footed CAC. Flat-footed and well, no, nineteen. Nineteen against flat-footed CAC. Nineteen against flat-footed. That is a miss. Oh. Okay. Um, but Friss and PG are on the wall. Callum. All right, Callum is going to take uh, the battery out of his other gun uh, that he never uses, the, uh, not the Thunderstrike, the uh, Diminisher, or no, the Liquidator pistol. And he is going to cast Explosive Blast on the John to the uh, <laughs> west. <laughs> to the west. All right, uh, roll a nice d20, don't roll a natural got it. one. Right in the yeah. last episode, we got yeah. it. I love saying John. Uh, I saw a license plate, Joe, the other day that said um, Johnette, and I meant to take a picture of it and send it to you, and I was like, you must know this woman. She's from Philly. Um, yes, yes. An old friend of mine, Johnette. An old, a good old friend, Johnette. 
Um, <laughs> so anyway, I cast uh, explosive Yeah, so blast. you roll a, that roll a d20. Just don't roll a natural one, and it will hit the intersection, and then I'll roll a reflex save to see if I take full or half damage. Cool. Uh, not a natural one, thank God. That's a seven. Thought it was a one. Okay, uh, and I failed my reflex save with a natural two. The same die I've been rolling for the past month is just eating it in this final uh, combat. Uh, um, and I'm eating it up because I'm like, you're about to take 9d6, and that is going to be online roller, 35 damage. Nice. Ooh. 35 damage, and that guy hadn't been hit yet. And now it is Kreska's turn. Kreska, give me a piloting check. All right, Plus I'm going stick, to stick with my frosted emerald die that I got from our friends in Norse Foundry at Gen Con. Okay. Oh, no. Okay, it was on a natural 20, and then it rolled onto a natural 2. And oh. there. So it's going to be a 18. I mean, 18. All the screens are strobing white light, mm-hmm. and you just see mm-hmm. cameras mm-hmm. everywhere mm-hmm. of, like, planes flying out. And how he says, Captain, if anyone is to evacuate, now is the time. Oh, shit. You have a standard action. Uh, I can't do anything to that. I can't do anything. <laughs> oh, you're in the, uh, the hole. Yeah, well, uh, everyone. If you have a supernatural action, that can get through. It's just spells that can't penetrate it. I mean, you're. It's, I'm so glad you brought this up, Troy. I do have several supernatural actions. You know what they all do? Hmm? Uh, they all affect minds. Ah. <laughs> they do, they'd be really helpful right now. They can do all kinds of crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff. To minds. To minds. So it's fun um, facing exclusively undead for the entire last book of this adventure. Yeah, it was really inconvenient. <laughs> uh, Real pill. Kuzka sounds the alert. Howie says the time is now. Everyone flee. I'll stay here. Hold them off. Get out while you can. Um, PG says, I can handle these two as well. And she says so confidently. Um, I can... I have I have stuff left. Two resolve points left. So PG's going down with the ship. I mean, it's either that or ten minutes later, you know. So it's the Baycock's turn, and there is only two remaining. Uh, I'm gonna get my acrobatics checks out of the way. Nailed it, and cracked eye. Uh, nailed it, Natty 18. They got a plus 17 to acrobatics. Uh, the one in the back here can only move quarter speed. So uh, that is going, it can, that's going to be feet. Fif- 15 feet because it can fly 60. Um, but it actually flies uh, down at an angle uh, and lands on the ground 10 feet away from Dax. Um, and you're saying I can't fire at Kreska, right? That wall protects from any ranged stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, I will fire at Dex. Actually, in fact, yeah, I'll, I'll go there and I'll fire once at Dex. Uh, oh, Natty 18. That oh. is going to be a 36. Oh, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. No, no, no. I, I made a mistake. Uh, 31 to hit. CAC. That's exactly. Oh, no. <sighs> You needed a natty 18. You got a natty 18. A <laughs> couple so things are going to happen angry. here. Uh, first, we're going to roll out some damage. 11, 16, plus 9. 25 points of piercing damage, and I need you to roll a fortitude save or be paralyzed. Uh, 13 points of piercing damage. <laughs> so angry. What did, did you say fortitude? Yeah, fortitude. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. You have to escape this round, huh? This is the round. This round. Yeah. It's got to be this round. Got to be this round, huh? You got to make your way towards there. It is in, uh, uh, impossible for you to escape this round, but if you don't start making your way there soon. Okay, here it is. Oh. Well. 21. Oh, pass. Yes. Oh, oh my God. Oh no. That 
is a pass, <laughs> and now his oh, uh, his turn is over. However, the other one who also succeeded on his acrobatics check lands right next to the captain and howls through the force field. Kreska, give me a fortitude save. I don't think Wait, that, that I don't think, I don't think do that's that. a thing. Nothing penetrates it. Your force wall. Would it go through the force wall? Yes, it's force sound. As long as Kreska breath? can... He- is it a breath uh, weapon? Because that can't pass through. It's not breath. It's a supernatural howl. So there's your no force air, wall. No air on, on the ship and sound. Hold on. I know. Uh, I'm just wall asking. Your force wall. Ethereal sound creatures. Um, it blocks ethereal creatures. How could sound get through? It's like. Well, uh, I was I was going back and forth with David here, and David, you compared it to a gaze attack. Well, so explicitly in the force wall, gaze attacks can get through it. Uh, spells cannot. However, the way it kind of describes the effect, though, is it counts as a force field for um, effects that can't penetrate a force field. We're talking sound here, and like when you have your force field activated, it prevents you from actually eating, but doesn't like prevent you from talking. So I would assume sound can move through it. And the way we played it last time you fought the Baycocks, where there is no sound on this weird uh, underwritten ship, is that uh, <laughs> <laughs> the sound comes through on your comm units. Um, just pass the fortitude save and you're fine. It won't it's change fortitude. the entire course of the adventure if you fail. Oh my god. It's I, fortitude? I, I, I yeah. Just... Can it be will? No. No, I can't. <laughs> All right. Come, come on, on, Matthew. Come, come on. on. Do we have any bottle come caps on, left? Uh, only David has one. All right. Natty 15. Oh, okay. Dude. There you go. Great. 21. Yes. Oh. Yes. That is a pass. Okay. Yes. Oh. God. Oh, you Chris needed that like, natty 15, man. It's only plus six. I shall not hear you. I shall complete this mission. There is nothing but the mission. Absolutely huge. The wow. D20s are coming down our way. It is a start of round three. The captain has given you an order that if you're going to get off, get off now but there's so much up in the air can the captain pilot this ship towards the ultranaut what to do what to do it is pg's turn um so i want to look at the mechanic called diversion (laughs) create diversion because i can forego expertise when bluff to create diversion to grant uh allies within 60 feet to have also succeeded at creating a diversion until the beginning of my next turn cool and so I was thinking of doing that. Uh, basically, uh, I think PG takes out uh, an old, an old friend of hers, an old spoon she found on the Sarissa back in the day, and want to like throw it, and it kind of makes it look like a grenade, uh, but something that draws basically the attention of these creatures, so they would start attacking her instead of the captain and mm-hmm. her allies. And I need to roll a bluff, I'm assuming, for this. Uh, David, what do you got with this? Never heard of it. Yeah, I mean, diversion, that intuitively makes sense, but diversion is a lot less exciting than it seems. Um, you, oh, cool. You're right, it is, it is a bluff check versus uh, opposed by sense motive, uh, and it basically gives you a benefit on uh, stealth checks and kind of allows you to have cover concealment benefits for, like, if you're trying to hide. You throw the spoon and then, like, hide around a corner, which well, doesn't me. really help as much here. Okay, cool. What a what a fun fun thing then. Um, um, all right, so uh, PG will then be on the wall and then climb over to the to the uh, the John man uh, over here and then mm-hmm. puke down on him. There we go. He- Scrambles across the wall, vomits down. I roll a reflex save, which I fail with a nat five again. Excellent. Holy shit! I cannot dude. believe these rolls. Shit. Get them. So you're spending a resolve point every time you're doing this. Wow. I, I'm down to uh, I'm down to two hit point, uh, two resolve points left now. Oh uh, my! You had I lose revol- resolve points every time I puke. Well, I used I used <laughs> I renewed it last time, so I had two. So now this is my last two. So if All I right. renew it next time, I'll have one left, and that's going to be. 44 points of damage. Oh, yikes. All and right, PG. Yeah, what else? Yeah. No, actually, that was my... Uh, sorry, I used my move action. Otherwise, I would have got him. But All right. I would have been cool to create a diversion. Sorry, game. Seiyun. Suck. <laughs> Can Seiyun do 
just, you can just, you can fudge this. You can make me roll a mysticism check. She wants mm-hmm. to basically do a mental calculation of our chances of succeeding if she stays. You know, she wants to know if that force field will stay and if, if it's good. She feels compelled to be here, but she's also driven by the fact that she sees images of a life that was enjoyed before it was brutally ended. And she feels, like she said earlier, owed something more. So she's torn between escaping and staying behind. Um, How what she, long does what that her gut spell last, like? Callum? Uh, it lasts for 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Um, so you feel like that will hold for 12 minutes, and you would hope if Kreska can make her piloting checks, that would be enough time to drive it into the Stellar Degenerator. You are now in the window where you could get down and escape. There is always a chance that the Kreska will fail some checks, the 12 minutes will elapse, and these Baycocks will overwhelm her if you leave her alone. Oh, God. So it's really just a yeah. choice. And the- I got it. The, they could overwhelm her and pull up on the ship and just steer it away or put it off course <laughs> enough. All right. Uh, the exit towards the escape pods is through the elevators? Yep. There is a, an elevator to uh, the starboard and the port side. So Yana's going to swift action, activate her haste circuit, move directly in front of the door, and take one shot uh, at the Baycock that PG just vomited at, at before mm. she decides to, like, She's, she's moving towards the exit now, but she's going to take one last shot before le- heading out. Because okay, all she can so do is open the door now, so she's going to be in the same yeah. position. I got Take you. Um, at, at the one next to Cre- uh, this hollow screen, I don't know if you can shoot through it. We have before it. moving. What's that? Oh, before right. you move. You would just shoot before you move. Yeah, right? sure. I yeah. Agree. Okay, yep. great. Uh, roll to hit. Okay, here it comes. Flat 18 on the animal. die, 35. <laughs> yeah, nice. that guy's a mess. Come on. Come on. You guys 12 and 11 on the virtual die roller for a 35 points oh. of bludgeoning sonic oh. damage. All right. He, he, you just light him up before you make your way to the elevator door. Um, and Howie has opened the door for you. Uh, so Aww. the elevator down ah! to the transport. <laughs> <laughs> he has not uh, so to open the section. What is this? <laughs> is it time, Captain? What is this, L.A. Law? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Now, Captain? Now? Uh, it is... Uh, oh, yeah. Let's see what happens with the gravity. It stays at uh, high gravity. It is uh, Dax's turn. Um, you're sure you have the hit points right on this guy? Mm-hmm. I feel like he's taken like 140 points of damage. Didn't yeah, first hit him first, then I, okay. I thought the other one went down a lot faster. Um, Dex. Joe, I mean, Dex, I'm just, double, I'm just double checking. There yeah. were monsters. You vomited on him twice. Yeah. Um, and he failed both we'll- saves. Yeah. All right, he's going Wait. to... Let PG do her work. Let's see. Oh, I have to move half speed. Um, which is a problem. All right, so he'll... Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, yeah, he'll start moving, and he will um, enact his haste circuit as a swift action, and then uh, he will fire once at the Baycock that's uh, messing with Kreska. Uh... Here we go. One shot. Keep uh, deadly aim going there. Do, 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 doing the math. Doing the math. Here we go. Uh, that is a 20 against EAC. And is he still flat footed and a minus one? What's the other guy? Other guy. Wait, oh, you fired at the one near Kreska. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a miss. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. It is Dr. Friss's turn. Okay. You're right Friss. near Sayon. Yeah, he's still up Transport on the wall. Transport built for two right there. Yeah, he's going to take uh, one more shot out of his first range increment with the semi auto elite pistol. Uh, that is a netty 16. Uh, that is a 33, I think, to hit. 33 to hit is a hit. 
Okay, I guess flat footed, and that is. Oh wait, which one are you aiming at? The one, the one by PG. The one have underneath I, PG. Have I allowed? Oh, you climbed up the wall. Well, yeah, the problem yeah. is shooting through this hollow sphere. Have I allowed ranged attacks through there? I just want to stay. Consistent. I mean, I'm 15 feet up on the wall, so. Yeah, but the thing um, goes floor to ceiling. Yes, you. I thought you had. Okay, I don't know. then that's a fine. That is a hit. Okay. Uh, and that is 42 points of damage. And that is enough to kill Arr, that great god. That's oh. amazing. Do oh you move Flea, to the elevator? Flea, doctor. Um, okay, and he like gives one last look at those remaining. Jumps off the wall and boom, rolls, falls at, uh, and rolls heavier, twice as heavy as he normally is, and lands, kips up immediately at Seiyun's feet. Oh. Next to the elevator. Kips up immediately at Seon's feet. It is Callum's turn. All right. Callum is going to use... Um, I'm running out of spells, too. Uh, he's going to use... What's it called? It is called the thing with the nanites, where I change it into... Oh, my God, what's it called? Puncture veil? No. Mental silence? No. Uh, I change the air around the last John next to Kreska into <laughs> acid. Um, mm, and he's going to take uh, water, sorry. Water vapors within it. Um, no water. Oh, thank you. It's space. There's no air. No, there's water. I'm sweating <laughs> and I transfer my sweat into acid. <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think, I, if, I think if to think and howl and no sound, with yeah, no atmosphere, yeah, it's then it's, it's she can use the spell. Uh, what is it called, though? Why can't I find it? David, help me. I don't know what you're doing either. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Sydney, what are you doing? doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Am I on my wrong character? Oh, 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 sorry. It, I exited out of it and it opened up an old character from level eight, and I was like, where are all my spells? Uh, my level 12 <laughs> character. <laughs> That's amazing. There we go. It's uh, caustic conversion. Sorry, there caustic conversion. Mm. Uh, there's no save. I just have to hit your EAC, so let's see. Let's see. That is a natty 17. Nice. I do believe I'm going to hit that. Watch your plus, pl 12. Watch your plus 12. Oh, yeah, that's a plus hit. Plus 12. Uh, so you're going to take 4d4. You're going to take 10. Uh, and then an additional five acid damage at the end of its turn uh, for the round of the All spell's right. duration, which is like seven rounds. Ten initial and then five persistent. And it is. Callum is going to run and act as haste circuit and run all the way to the elevator door as he looks at Kreska the whole time, just like, you know, looking over his shoulder, like making eye contact, making sure like I'm going. You told me to, but is that OK? I'm going. Go. Okay. Callum runs to the door. Do you have the movement to get down the shaft, or is that the extent of your movement? That's the extent, because we're slowed right now. This is awesome. Kreska, it's your turn. Make a piloting check. Doctor, she says over the communicator. Remember what I asked you about my family. Oh. Yes, Chuba. Crack die. Okay, uh, that's going to be a 28. 28 piloting check. If it was a little off course, it now seems like it's back where it needs to be. And you are on the road to a collision. Howie says, this is the last chance for your friends. They must board the ship now and exit. I wish I could help in the fight. What'd you say? I shouted for everyone to flee. Everyone to flee. Howie says, he. I wish I could help in the fight, but I'm all hands. Uh, it is the Baycock's turn, the one remaining Baycock. Realizing that you are a lost cause and he has used his howl ability, he will fire at either PG or Dax. Two shots. One, two, three Dax, four, five, six PG for the first shot. Two Dax. Can't remember what all y'all's hasties are. Oh, you, you're not gonna hit, dude. You need a nat 20! 
I'll tell you, I got a plus 17 to hit. Oh. oh. You don't need a nat, Twanza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 34. It's 17. Plus 17 with two shots? A plus 17, plus 17, and I rolled a nat 17. That's absurd. Oh that's that's ridiculous. So insane. It's, right. a plus tw- it's a plus 21 to hit. I took the minus four. It's plus 17. Just looking at my sheet, and I'm so angry. <laughs> is it 34? I am a I am a plus sixteen, and I'm a higher level than this creature. That doesn't make any sense. I see. Oh, yes, it's it's, plus, yes, it's a hit. He's a plus twenty one to hit. Uh, so if I do two attacks, it's plus seventeen, plus seventeen. No, no, no. It's uh, not your problem with your math. It's a problem with <laughs> the underlying concepts. Of the game. <laughs> yeah. Why does a creature who is a level below me have a plus twenty one to hit, and I have a plus sixteen to hit? And I am, like, maxed. 28 piercing. Do not fail this fortitude save. God. You're really pushing it. You're really pushing it. Well. 28 piercing. 16 piercing. Oh, God, I would take all that damage right now to not roll this fortitude save. Come on, Joe. Come on, Joe. Come on, Daxi. You son of a bitch. I, <laughs> I can feel it coming. Come on. Come on, dude. Natural 18. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> God. Just feel a tempting fate over and over and over. Second attack is a PG. Oh, no. Another natty 16. Well, I rolled natty 17. Uh, so that is uh, 17, 16, 33 to hit. Yeah, I'm uh, 24. <laughs> so super hit. Okay. Damage is not too bad. Uh, oh, yeah, no, 69. 25 points of piercing and roll a fortitude save. Oh, my God. God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, right. If I... <gasps> Wait, if I fail this, then it's really bad news for everyone. Oh, my God. They could devour your soul like they did Linnaeus. <sighs> not oh. again. Not again, sir. Oh, um, yes. Natty 15. Uh, 20, 24 point. Uh, 24. <laughs> Total. 24 total. That yeah. is a success. Nice. nice. Oh, you oh my god. Are paralyzed. god. Okay. I can't believe it. And it is PG's turn. If you do uh, not exit this round. I mean, PG made her peace. M- made her peace. She said she was going to stay with the captain. Uh, but she has one resolve point left. And has already re re uh, reused, like uh, refueled her acid, I guess. It's pretty gross. Uh, and will, however, she will move up. She will use her move action, but she's moving at half speed, right? Is she? Um, That's what I was about to ask. Unless it's in the yeah. gravity changed. Yeah, it's high gravity right now. I'm, I'm not rolling the new gravity until after Seiyun's action. Oh. Okay. Um, and I... Um, so That's I'm how I started m- doing it at the beginning, so I've just stayed consistent with that. Just so want to make sure her Seiyun moves half speed. That, then I'll roll and check. <laughs> right. um, I'm going to move up here, and now I'm like 50. I'm st- I would still hit Kreska, actually, so I'm going to no, move no, up. No, you won't. No, I'm you won't. in a force field. I'm in a force bubble. And it, she got a force bubble. And it ex- explicitly blocks breath weapons. Nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's something we, we may have forgot about. Callum and Seiyun both moved very far uh, in high gravity. Uh, just check your math to make sure. You could probably still get down this round, but... Um, yeah, did you did you move half speed, Sydney? With haste. Ah. Uh, I enacted my haste circuit. Yeah, so uh, Seiyun, you might be a little further back. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit further back. You should like still be able to get feet. out, uh, yeah. if that's All your right. intention. Well, here comes my, my breath, breath weapon. I have uh, two I more. I made the save. More. All right. Uh, well, and it's... Well, I assume oh, I made 43, it. Uh, 43 26. points. Yeah, 43 points. Four sixes in there. 43 right. points. Nice. So 21, 21 points of acid damage nice. against yes. this guy. It is Seiyun's turn. What do you do? Oh, my God. Uh, I guess they have it under control. Seiyun really has one last good shot on this thing that just barely misses the edge of that force field. Think about it, though. You've got to get down there. You've got to strap in, and you got to get out. Howie has made it pretty clear. You stay yeah. and shoot, you're here. You go, you, you make it. I will say, out of character, that I, Grant Berger, owed May Shun a better life than what she got, and Seiyan yeah. is my only chance at doing that. So Grant will take over 
and will tilt the battle in Se Yun's head away from the sense of purpose she was built with in mind towards being able to figure out some of those experiences and emotions she talked to Dax about overwhelming her earlier before this battle and will flee through the escape route. And Seon is gone. It is now Dax's turn. Dax, it's going to be tough for you to make it there, but you might be able to pull it off. Is that your intention? You got to roll. Oh, that's right. Gravity yes. change. Uh-oh. This could actually change everything. Okay, there will be a change of gravity. Okay, so it's a good. D20 roll to see if the gravity changes. The DC of that changes every round. And then it's a D100 roll to see what the gravity will be. Oh, my God. <sighs> Zero gravity. <gasps> oh, it's just like you're back on the drift rock. Oh, fuck. Zero G. You begin, all of you, slowly floating off the ground. Oh, oh my God. How about Kriska? I'm bolted in. She's bolted in. Where Friss is standing, he could probably push himself through the door. Hell, where Callum's standing, there might be a way. PG and Dax are going to struggle. Unless someone has a spell or ability. Didn't Kreska use a fire extinguisher or something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Back I in did. the drift rock. I was also becoming a zombie. That was, those were fun times. <laughs> uh, well, here's a question for David. Uh, this is what I'm trying to look up, uh, but it doesn't say it under jetpack. Is the uh, does haste work with a jetpack? Yes. Yes, yeah, we've ruled it. we've ruled that previously in the past. And if you want to read up on zero gravity, because this is something that clearly no rational person preps out of the blue like this, it's on page four hundred two. Because <laughs> I'm frantically reading myself. God, I hate it. Yeah. The way I remember it is like you've got to push yourself. Yeah. Off. Mm -hmm. Uh, to get places. However, if you have some sort of spell or other ability that can propel you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But Callum is screwed. No, I'm right by the wall. I can push myself. The hollow wall? Or am I not? I mean, that's not like a solid object. There is only some sort of base. There is a base to it that uh, you're not flying. Are you, Callum, if you're flying? Oh, but you're starting to lift off the ground, so. Starting to. We'll see. We'll see. Well, th- Chris is going to be fine. I oh, think. and there's basically here's another. Well, I was going to say here's another one too. The spider climb. What does spider climb gives you? It gives you a climb speed, right? Oh. You can move on walls and presumably floors as well, thanks to the spider climb, right? Wait, Callum, uh-huh. do you have spider climb? No, no not Callum, are, but PG uh, though. PG does. Yeah, so you would just actually stay on the ground. You wouldn't even yep. float up. Uh. All right, so D- Dax is just thinking uh, he wants to make sure that Callum gets out of here. That's his objective right now. Callum and says, don't, don't worry about me on the comm unit. He goes, he, as he's floating, I'll figure it out. I got it. Yeah, but you don't know how to fly as well as Dax, and this is a serious gravitational situation, right? But I do have reality leap. Hmm. So Which I have is a what? spell. Uh, It's like a a fucked up version of teleport. So I can go in a direction, but I might mess it up and like injure myself on the way, which is fine. So you could leap into the elevator. uh, Into the shaft. Yeah, but that's not my concern. My concern is you flying the escape pod out of this gravitational swell that is like you could get sucked into. You know what I mean? Oh, 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 talking about that gravity. After you're already in the pod. Um, Yeah, so she, she needs Dex. I got Basically. a plus four to piloting. I'm going to die. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ken, <laughs> hey, that's um, what I'm taking. I'm taking this whole bone ship into the, into the yeah. starting generator with a plus right, well, here's four what piloting. I would Don't forget, do. like, the once you're, you're in this safe zone, like how we said, you don't have to worry about being sucked in. It was before that you had to worry about being sucked in. And then after, you're going to be incinerated. But this is the safe zone. 
The worst pilot should be able to get out of here. <laughs> thanks, Caleb says. Gee, <sighs> thanks. Yeah, that was. I, that well, well, here's what I want to do. I just want to, uh, you know, just look back to PG and just say, protect her. And then he's just going to gun the jetpack, and his objective is to just go right into Callum and grab Callum and just both of us slam into the uh, door there and then stop at the door to the... Uh, do we have to do a move action to open the door? Or is it no, open? How we, how how we, we open, open the doors, but how are you going to get there? You're going to propose like an L shape because you can't go through the... Uh, Why not? Eddy, and you can't go through the hologram. Why can't I go through the hologram? I've already established that you can't move through the hologram space. You have to go around it. But I don't understand. We, nobody flew through the hologram. I mean, the dude flew through the hologram, didn't he? No, he always went around. David kept me honest about that. If you can fly up and around, you're fine, but you can't fly through it. <laughs> it should be fine. Yeah, I mean, he's hasted. He's got he's 120 hasted. feet yeah. of flying movement. Um, yeah. Really, the grabbing of Callum is, is uh, you know, I don't know what rules you want to do push. for that. Yeah, I just think that it's him. epic and cool and very final bookie. It's just like... I just want to make sure like, you have the movement. So you're going to fly up and you're going to fly into Callum and push him through the doorway. Uh, just do the math on the, the space. So 40 feet to there. 40, yeah. 80... You have it. You have it. Got, I just yeah, I've got, yeah, I've got 120 feet to move this round. Yeah. Okay. This, there's a rule for this. For it grabbing the character? Uh, well, so I think there should be a roll to see if you grab it, him. Properly grab him. Probably like an athletics check would be my guess. If you don't, though, you will collide and you both will go off kilter towards the door. <laughs> uh, so it works out anyway. Which, which should still work out, but then you're struggling to get in as opposed to it being a proper grab. I think there should be a role here, though, for that. Yeah, if you fail it... hit the elevator. Here's the what button. I'll say is, if you fail it, only one of you will make it into the elevator shaft. Uh, okay. No, but go for it, because I, I have reality uh, leap. No, no, Yeah, because you have it. reality leap. So I have I, reality I leap, so go for it anyway. Okay, uh, I'll just fly... Sh- Knowing uh, Callum as well as he does, that Callum can just zip and zap to wherever he wants. Mm-hmm. He's just like, flies by and is like, Callum, let's go to the pod now. And oh, he'll I just thought you were going to grab me. All right, bye, oh, bye Dax. I'll be down no, there. No, uh, <laughs> David and Troy said I'm not allowed to because they don't want to have fun anymore. <laughs> we high right five. We do go a cool it. high five in the air as we're floating. I'm like, whoa. No, you know, I'm down we did for that. a roll. I'm just not down for like, if that roll fails, somebody can't get to the shaft. You know? well, it's, right. it's actually going to be... It's actually going to be a roll here to see if you make the grab, and then a separate roll for each of you to see if you go off kilter. Yeah. So that's what it would be. But a failure would mean. What's the kilter? We did this back in the in the on the drift rock. You were we were bouncing off kilter left and right and taking penalties. And And uh, it takes you acrobatics. But if Callum's got reality leap, you don't have to worry about it. If you want to take the chance, there'll be a consequence. But but remember with reality leap, 50% of the time, you have to roll that extra 1d4 and you go past where you're trying to shoot, which theoretically could take Callum through that wall out to whatever the adjacent room is. If that's space or something else. Yeah. Damn it. So what do you want to do? Do you want to take your chances with reality leap oh or take God. your chances with off kilter? We can't chance reality leap, Callum. And he just goes stakes. plowing into you. <laughs> uh, here we go. Athletics check from Dax. Uh, crack die. Oh, boy. Oh. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 So there's your natural two. There you there go. Is. Hope you're happy. There what was is. the DC, by the way? Do you have David. a DC in mind? There, There's a DC for this next off-kilter check, this first flavor check. That's up to Troy. Oh, oh so the athletics check is just flavor. Well, Just make me take a brute. Just give me a, a black eye. He punches me in the eye. Let's roll for off-kilter. You failed the athletics check, so you're What's just... The DC? What's the DC? DC 20, athletics or acrobatics on the off-kilter. Okay. And we both so roll, right? Each, each of you roll. Okay, I got this. I got this. Okay, I'll roll acrobatics. Uh, that is a 30 acrobatics. Boom. That is a natty 14 plus 13. Yes! So you both make it. You're not off kilter. (laughs) I'm sorry! (laughs) (laughs) So you bump and you both go like towards the door, basically? Yeah, into the shaft. Yeah, Yeah. but just- Into the the elevator, yeah. All right. 
So Dax and Callum go into the elevator and into <laughs> the shaft. So cool. And it is Dr. Friss's turn. Okay. Yeah. So Friss has spider climb. So he, whenever yep. everything else starts lifting up off the ground, he stays rooted and he moves to the door. It takes a quick moment to look back at, back at Kreska. And so bad. Um, um oh uh he's got kibasa he shakes and says thank you captain thank you doctor and it's like bastard moves into the shaft down to the escape pod into the shaft into the escape pod Callum's turn. Callum, you and Dax, uh, you're heading down to the ship, right? Yeah. So it's your action now. You can go down. Uh, you can press the button on the elevator, and it shoots you down. And you see this little escape pod that's like a three-seater, but there's only life support systems for two people. You'll be able to use both of those yourself. Uh <laughs> Get super high on the you oxygen really mixture. On life support. <laughs> uh, it is Kreska's turn. Let me guess. Piloting check? Yeah, give me a piloting check. Plus 10. Natty 18. Oh, oh man, you've been oh, fired. In zone. You've been fired. You guys are, that are, uh, you're, I mean, uh, Seyun and Friss aren't down there yet, but Callum and Dax are. You see out the side of the ship here. You can see how close you are to the degenerator. Moments from impact. It's hard to tell. Kreska, any actions you'd like to take? Uh, I'm going to take a standard action to... Uh, uh, to... look over my spell list. Okay. And... Uh, That's the action. <laughs> That's my action. <laughs> look over my... to mentally run through my spell list. Howie, time to impact. 12 seconds, Captain. Very well. Thank you, Howie. PG, are you all right? PG is currently on the floor, holding on. I'm saying, yes, yep. I'm still here. Thank you for staying with me. Of course. And she closes her eyes. Are we still fighting the last Baycock just <laughs> floating in the air? Oh, and yeah. She has her... It's the Baycock's turn. Will you die honorably? Or like a pig? <laughs> the Baycock oh, shoots at you twice. You can't spell PG Pigs. without pig. In, in, zero gra damage, in zero gravity, spinning around. Oh, yeah, he's flying his around. acid. Take his acid. Five acid from the Calum spell earlier. Oh, the five oh, yeah. acid. Take your acid. Take your acid. You just die? told me to take acid. Uh, take yeah, so acid. He, is, <laughs> he is floating, but luckily he can fly. So as he floats, he takes it all the way to the ceiling and just pot pot fires down a PG. See if I can kill you straight or if you're going to kill me. Uh, first attack, Natty 17. That's all this thing rolls when it doesn't roll five, fours, and threes. That is a 30. Uh, 38 to uh, no, uh, I did minus four, so uh, 34 hit. to hit. 34 to hit. Yep, yep. Okay, rollouts of damage. Give me a fortitude save. Six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Right. That's 19 Ooh. points of damage. Uh, I passed the fortitude with 25. Oh. Okay. Ooh. 19 points of damage. Second attack. Uh, 33. 16. To yep. Hit. Yep. Okay, roll another fortitude save, eight and seven, 15. That's 24 points of damage. 21 on the fortitude save. Guys have been oh lights out every with every, every single, single save. save. Oh my God. See, you guys were worried about nothing. PG, it is your <laughs> turn. Okay, PG is gonna, at this point, crawl over uh, to the Baycock as, and she's when she's underneath him, she's just gonna turn around and with her last resolve point, is just gonna th throw more acid up okay. against him. 
And I think she cries. She cries as she does so because this is unbelievably painful for her. Mm, uh, I bet. It's her last, her last life. So, so you can see probably blood mm. as well. Oh. Uh, this poor old woman, what we did to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's going to be... Uh, tw- uh, just 31 oh, points re- of damage, but roll a DC. Uh, I failed the reflex save. 31 points of damage. Nice. 31 points of damage. He is still up. He was the one that didn't get hit a lot. Uh, now it mm-hmm. goes to Seyan. Seyan frisses in the elevator, so you're able to activate it. You come down and you step into this uh, two-seater with life support. Friss is there as well. Um, I'll, I can move uh, move you guys out of initiative a little bit here. Tell me what's happening in Seyan Friss pod. Uh, Friss is just going to like crawl is there's, there's still no gravity right so he's gonna like crawl along the walls and like kind of pull himself by his sticky claws his front paws into his seat like clap himself in give a hand to since he can brace himself he's gonna give a hand to say if she needs it to get her secured and uh the, and then he's gonna just start like powering it up and do whatever he needs to do to get this thing clear Okay, um, but, 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 let's go to the other pod because it would be Dax's turn. Dax, what is happening in the Dax and Callum pod? Dax is just immediately like, strap yourself in, get secure. And he's immediately like, just try, trying to fire up the controls and uh, get locked in to eject this thing as soon as possible. Okay, uh, you fire up the controls. Callum is strapped in. Uh, roll a piloting check. Uh, okay. Uh, 27. You notice that outside of sorry. your... I'm sorry. Uh, I had bad effects on. Um, that is uh, 29. You notice that outside of your transport, uh, there must have been some shrapnel or something from uh, the attack from the <clears throat> Gate of the Twelve Moons on your ship, and you're you're going to need to go outside of the ship to unlatch it, where you don't need to breathe. You could do that, but obviously Callum can't, unless yeah. Callum wants to put on a spacesuit. So yeah, he notices this is happening, and he's just like, "Stay here. I'll be right back. I always come back." <laughs> Don't say that. Okay. And then I'll go into space. <laughs> Dax, you you float outside of this ship, and you're trying to dislodge it. And you can tell that, like the defense systems of the Gate of the Twelve Moons, were firing up at the ship, and it must one errant ray must have hit this and caused some sort of fusion between the metal of the transport and the shaft that shoots the escape pod out. And so you're panicking because you know you don't have a lot of time and you look in the reflection of the pod where you can see Callum on the other side and you just see the stellar generator. It's like 10, 20 miles away, which oh is, you know, Nothing it's not that far. <laughs> right? You just, the a massive uh, size of this thing is just, it's overwhelming and you're That's looking so at close. this. <laughs> yeah, it's... It, so it's, okay, so he's dead. <laughs> well, you have saying. time here. You have time. You've just got to get this done quickly, and you're just you're 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 scrambling to try and uh, figure this out. And as you do, you feel a presence next to you, and it's as if time stops, and you look and like just sitting in midair next to you is a woman. (laughs) It's a Lashunta female. And her face is blurred out. Blurred out as it always has been. As these memories of this person have just trickled back in intermittently over the years. But for the first time, the blurriness starts to fade away and the 
image of this woman becomes clear. And for a moment, you think it's Seiyun, or, or maybe even <laughs> Mei Shun, but then you realize it's neither. And again, it looks like time stops. You look at Callum, and Callum is just panicking and like waving you to come in. That you're running out of time. And you just, you're fixated on this woman whose face you can now see. She reminds you so much of Mei Shun, so much of Seiyun. But there's something else there. This Lashunta is a, a little older. She has a little more wisdom in her eyes. And she looks at you with tenderness and smiles and speaks. Hello, Dax. I'm sorry to always come to you in times of distress, but I believe that shows you were more successful than Stanbach could have ever imagined. <laughs> she reaches out and touches your hand and you don't know if it's a trick of the brain or not but you can almost feel her hand on top of yours you were created in the image of a man a sick man who was taken off the streets and used up in the hopes of creating another mindless drone galaxy, the, the universe is full of these types of people. That is what you were supposed to be. But my husband had other plans for you. He was a great man, but all of his genius could never find a cure for our little star. <sighs> he thought he could simply replace her with a new version. When I first held her in my arms, I, I felt love, the same love I felt when I held the true Mei Shun on her entrance into this world. But as she grew, I knew she wasn't the child I lost, and I grew to hate the thing he called our daughter. That anger festered within me, festered for a long time until my mind fractured and the voices entered in. The voices of the Star Eater. And well, I believe you know the story from there. Callum is like banging on the cockpit window <laughs> and you're just fixated on this. When Stanbach created you, he did so in the image of a man that Astral Extractions gave him. But it was Stanbach's soul that he placed in you. A soul that perhaps yearned for the life he once had and the love he once had with me. A soul full of hope. And that's what you have, Dax. While he could never bring back our little star or fix our fractured love, you may have been his greatest creation of all. <gasps> because while your memories may be tied up in his, the life you've lived will be greater than all of ours combined. We were all servants, Dax. I to the devourer, Stan Bach to his unending quest to erase the fate of our child. Even the poor Mei Shan, you spent most of, she spent most of her life as a servant of that cult and the company that created you. But you, you are about to save the galaxy from complete annihilation. She reaches out and like puts a hand on your cheek and you feel the warmth of her hand even in the vacuum of space. I love you. And I always will. And she leans forward to kiss you and as she does, we see flashes of Stanbach walking with Mei Shun through the carnival. Flashes of Stanbach being propositioned by astral extractions when they forced him into doing what he did. <laughs> flashes of that husk 
that was Stanbach, left behind in the Devourer's ship with all the failed copies, and the one success that was Seiyun. And now we see him superimposed upon you as they lean in and kiss, and white light envelops the cockpit as Dax closes his eyes and embraces her. Friss and Seiyun get out as well and pull out just far enough away to see the white light as well. And it overwhelms them. From there, we cut to a window of an electronics store. Maybe we've seen it before, maybe not. They're all very similar looking. A lone hollow screen in the middle is playing a commercial. The commercial ends and it comes back with the now very well-known graphic for the Good Morning Glip Glorp show (laughs) (laughs) with music playing underneath. A group of people walking by start to gather to listen and we see the the Glip Glorp bands wrapping up their song <laughs> as they come back from commercial and the band leader kicks it to Roger Glip Glorp who's sitting behind his trademark desk, desk and is like, welcome back to Good Morning Glip Glorp. He's tapping a pencil on his desk while he's talking. <laughs> All right, let's get right into it. <laughs> it's the news that everyone is talking about. The ancient super weapon known as the Stellar Degenerator has been destroyed. The studio audience cheers. People standing outside the store start cheering. They're watching it. That's right. It's gone, baby, gone. Crews have been searching the site of the destruction, and as you can see, there's not much left. Cuts to a screen of, like, several little tiny ships searching uh, the area where the Empire of Bones and the Stellar Degenerator were. There's no Gate of the Twelve Suns. There's just chunks of moon and bone and metal floating hundreds of feet from each other. Early reports indicate that the corpse fleet intended to use the super weapon to enact terrorist acts on the packed worlds. But thankfully, we can all rest easy knowing that we won't be obliterated in our sleep. The band leader pipes up. I bet your wife is disappointed. Total obliteration would have been better than a lifetime with you. <laughs> the crowd all laughs and Roger just shakes his head. Son of a gun. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Most bittersweet in all of this, of course, were the heroes that risked their lives to stop the Stellar Degenerator from getting into the wrong hands. <laughs> the Starfinder Society is officially named the Drift Rough Five, and their allies as the saviors of the packed worlds. Uh, still of your first appearance on Good Morning Glip Warp shows up. <laughs> <laughs> they were a fun bunch to have on the show, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, it's assumed they all perished in the act of saving us all. A statue will be erected outside of the Starfinder Society headquarters in their memory. If any of them have any next of kin, they will be hunted down and given medals of honor in their name. <laughs> <laughs> Hunted down. Hunted down doesn't seem like the right phrase there. Who's writing the copy for these things? What's that? The new kid? My nephew? Oh, he's a good kid. I'll talk to him later. <laughs> Folks, I'd now like to introduce my first guests. They are the Sheeran, responsible for assembling the Drift Rock 5. And rumor is, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this, son? With the success of this mission, they are a shoe-in for the senator seat that just opened up. Give it up for the future senator of the Pack World Console, Cheers Kisk! <laughs> And then the band, <laughs> maybe the band plays like an Ed Sheeran song to be funny because he's a Sheeran. <laughs> uh, and Chizkis comes out, and then it's like in slow motion, the crowd stands up to applaud Chizkis. And then we cut to a shot from like behind Chizkis as Chizkis comes out and waves and puts both arms up. And Roger slowly stands up as well and is clapping. And flash bulbs are going off, and everyone is applauding Chizkis. And giving him all the praise that belongs to you. Mm. Bummer. Now we cut back to a pod floating in space. 
nothing around it. We close in. We get close enough that we see the scorch marks on the side where it was melted into the hull of the ship. And then we go inside and see Callum asleep and alone. Callum, you wake up. You look around. Look out into space and have no idea where you are. You look down at your pocket and see a blood stain that's like grown to a certain point and then stopped where Linnea's ear is. What do you do? Callum immediately has flashbacks to uh, being on Hush's ship and when he woke up and like everyone was dead and he, he could, couldn't remember what happened. He was alone, drifting through space until he was found by the rusty rivet. And he just like has these, it's like he's remembering and re-remembering and then he thinks like, the rusty rivet found me and then I found, uh, and then I found the Sarissa and then I found everybody and, and then he remembers they're all gone. There's no way. He's the only one. Like he knows it, he knows it. And he feels his pocket and he's like, am I bleeding? Wait, am I bleeding? And he looks at his hands and he realizes it's, the ear, Linnea's ear, her blood. And he feels so alone, like the most alone he's ever felt. And he's been alone his whole life. And he can't do it. He can't be alone. He's realized it, it doesn't work. He's had friends and he won't go back to what he was before. This like space urchin, this unknown orphan with no friends, no family, no understanding of how to control himself or live a life. And he's like, I can have a life. I had a life. I had friends and I had a purpose. And he's going to start the spell again. He's going to put the ribbon out in front of him and he's going to hold the ear close to his chest. And it's like, you know, it's gray. It's gone gray now, but he's like focusing pulling at the strings of Linnea's DNA and the component of the sword just praying you know that this is going to work so you close your eyes just as you did on the bridge of the Empire of Bones ear in one hand sword in the other this time there are no distractions and you focus focus on the spell and after ten minutes pass Somewhere out in the universe, somewhere in the spheres, your soul, Linnea, hears a whisper. You have been floating in this nether space for what seems like seconds and an eternity. And this is the first time you've felt a presence. And it's a voice that you recognize, but you can't place. It's the voice of Callum. And just as you hear that voice, other voices start to come in as well. Familiar voices from your childhood. The voice of your mother, McCullen Donovan, talking to you as a little girl, scolding you, loving you, holding you, abandoning you, ignoring you, overlooking you. But she's calling you to her. And Callum is calling you another way. What do you do? Linnea listens to the voices, the conflicting voices inside of her. Um, Mother, there is someone who needs me. 
I think you can understand. And she returns. I don't know how that would work, but... I do. <laughs> Roll a D100. <laughs> oh. Maybe just text me what you roll. Okay. And I'll text you back something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> God damn it. I can't, I'm so nervous I can't find Troy's goddamn number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> just type in everything. Okay. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Oh God. <laughs> oh my God. Would you say, Mother, I I have to go. And so, Callum, with your eyes closed, suddenly you feel a presence near you. And you lose consciousness. You lose consciousness and there's just inky blackness surrounding you. You feel like you're falling. No, flo- more like floating. You're, you're suspended without the weight of a body like you felt in zero gravity upon the bridge of the Empire of Bones. You push through the air as if you are air. And you look around knowing full well that you don't even have eyes, but you see wispy shadows like smoke signals puffing in and out of existence. You've been here before, twice. You know that this is what death feels like. Voices distant, sometimes all at once, quiet and loud. These are people you've known throughout your short life, just speaking to you. Get up, no one will miss you. Stay out of my way, you have no one else, street rat. Where are you gonna go? Good luck, you'll never make it out here. And then voices you've heard more recently, voices of Dax, Qualo, Linnea, Kreska, Friss, saying things like, you can come with us if you want. Good job, Callum, you're safe here. Can you play the bass? I care about you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Then a rush. You can feel every fiber in your body knitting itself back together and you feel like you're on fire as you are thrust back into your body and your large black eyes open to see a creature sitting in the transport with you. From there, we open on a gentle white capped scene. It's a cloudy day. A little humid and warm, but very, very pleasant. The sea gently caresses the shore where the calm, flat clouds meet the ocean in the far, far distance on the horizon. It feels safe after everything we've seen thus far. We pull back from this mellow ocean and the easygoing clouds, and our view slowly rotates around to unveil verdant forest land not too far away from the sandy shores gently buzzing with the sound of alien life. A drone of something like crickets caresses the air. As our eyes creep across the emerald vista, we see a giant, transparent ferris wheel in the distance. It looks marvelous as the lights at its joints slowly oscillate through the visible spectrum of light. It's a Castrovellian fair, and standing alone in the foreground, looking at it from a distance, is Seiyun. She hears a voice. I always wanted to take you there, you know. It's a familiar yet alien voice muttered from somewhere behind Seiyun's ears, but her eyes don't budge from the carousel in the distance. She strains her ears, tries to hear what she imagines families must sound like, having fun. But instead all she can hear is the ocean slowly eroding the white, fine sand behind her. I always wanted to show you the world. 
The voice per persists with obvious affection and concern still Sayun refuses to divert her attention away from the inaccessible fair. Her antennae stand straight up as she focuses on the distance. I always wanted warmth and peace for you and your mother. Now these words are impossible to ignore. Tears fall from Seyun's eyes. Her lip begins to quiver and her gaze loosens. She still refuses to make eye contact with him. Why didn't you love me like her then? Why didn't you take me to the fair? Why do I have to remember her life? I'm stuck with this dream that's not mine. The Ferris wheel. The view of the beach from the top. The candy and the stuffed animals. All of those things that you gave to her. They're not mine. I can't ever go there. Why did you make me? <laughs> Stanbach Vanya steps into frame right in front of Seyun's eyes. He looks like a giant next to her. He's just as serene as the point where the ocean meets the sky. His hands rest sweetly on Seyun's shoulders. What I asked of you was never fair, never what you deserved. Never would I would have given you if I had any choice in the matter. Sayan pushes away. Let go of me. It's, it's too late for this. Her tears start to fall with abandon from her beautiful viridescent eyes. And Stanbach just pleads with her. It's never too late for you to know that I loved you and so did your mother. Even if you were born differently to Meishan, you'll always be our little star. And Seyun wails deeply as she surrenders to her father's embrace in this strange imagining. Finally, as she and the world around her are subsumed by an impossibly bright light, consuming everything around her, she feels it. Just before the end, even if for a moment, she feels love. Dr. Frist, the last thing you remember is the white light, the same white light that Seyun just felt, and then the pain, and the pain is overwhelming. It's only a memory now, but as keen as it was so many years ago when you cut into your own flesh with a jagged shard of scrap, and you did it to steal away the emerald ring, buried deep in a junk pile in the salvage den, it's still hung around your neck. It's the only beautiful thing you'd ever seen. But there was always a deeper hurt, more than the beatings, the starvation, the humiliation. Worst of all was the loneliness, the dull ache that you tried to bury ever since. As the pain begins to both increase and lessen, all at the same time, you can't help but wonder in this moment who your parents were. Did they ever love you, or were you just another rat in a litter? One more shrieking, hungry mouth. A spare. But then a thought strikes you. As clear, as warm, as dawn in the desert, and the pain subsides. In this moment, you know that your bones won't bleach in the sands of the red planet. You won't be shot in the back gunned down in some Absalom back alley. Here at the end, you saved the galaxy with the only family you've ever known. The only family you'd ever need. And in the face of death, you smile. From there, we close in on a foreign moon somewhere in the galaxy. Lush forest life, trees, strange avian creatures flying about. And somewhere on this moon, there is a council chamber. Several tall figures sit around a table, all maracoy dressed in finery. On several 
posters above the table. We see images of PG, images throughout time, (laughs) young PG, old PG, images of the drow that captured her, the mother drow that abused her, PG on Good Morning Glipglorp. One of the elders speaks. We must erase her while we recognize the hardships that she faced when taken by the drow. These augmentations, the violence that she perpetuated, whether against evil or no, life is sacred to our people and cannot be treated so lightly. As word of her involvement in all of this spreads, we must stifle it amongst our people, so that they will not be corrupted as she was. Her name, her life, her deeds must all be erased. Are we all in accord here? And together all of the Elder Marikoi say, I But from there, we move to a dark alleyway. Elsewhere on the planet, a a hooded figure pushes their way down the alley, opens a door, and enters a dimly lit room full of young Marikoi. The figure removes their hood to reveal a female presenting Marikoi with a cybernetic eye looking at the rest of the group. All youthful Marikoi armed to the teeth with various cybernetic enhancements. (laughs) There's slogans like rise up and we will not be controlled painted on the walls. The one who enters walks to the head of the room and begins to make a speech to rile up, rile up the crowd about their next mission. And as they speak, we close in on an image painted on the wall behind her. It's an image of PG that has been transformed into an emblem, a symbol for this group of young freedom fighters (laughs) who will never let her memory die. Awesome. From there, we see the engines of a ship flare as it hits atmosphere. A military ship, a transport. The thrusters fire and the ship makes its descent into a docking bay with that trademark hiss sound. The airlock (laughs) opens. And after a moment, a a series of figures begin to emerge. There's maybe a dozen of them, children and adults, all Vesk. Among them, supporting the oldest of them, an ancient female Vesk with a eye patch and a robotic right leg, is a younger Vesk that we've actually seen before. She looks not unlike Kreska, though she holds herself with a rigid military bearing. It's Najili Dokvadoro. Kreska's niece. Come, great grandmother, Najili says. The older Vess, clearly the veteran of many, many battles, yanks her arm away from Najili. No, the old Vess crones. I shall step foot on my homeworld once again without anyone's assistance. Najili holds up her arms. She will not fight her elder, the great Mastaletha, matriarch of Clan Dokvadoro. Mastaletha, using her battle-ravaged Doshko as a cane, hobbles her way down the ramp and onto the deck of a docking bay. The entire clan follows her to the door, the door that will lead outside to the planet none of them have seen in over 16 years. Mastaletha hesitates. Najili once again steps forward. Are you sure about this, great-grandmother? The world cast us aside so quickly, they will shun us. Maybe we were better off out in open space. Hush, young one. Masaletha draws herself up to her full height. It is time to return home. No matter what awaits us on the other side of this door. Masaletha nods, and Najili hits the release, the door whisks aside, and the family steps out into the open plaza of the spaceport. 
and they see down at the bottom of a long set of ceremonial stone septs, legions of Vesk soldiers, rows and rows of them in formation. There must be thousands of them, a phalanx of the galaxy's most feared fighting force. And it's absolutely silent. Then somewhere amongst this throng, an officer barks an order and every single one of the soldiers in perfect unison just snaps to attention, tucking their doshkos against their shoulders. Then slowly, quietly at first, then growing in power, the soldiers begin to tap the butts of their doshkos against the ground. Rhythmic, almost like a chant. Boom, boom. Boom. Najili, only 18 and having spent nearly all of her life off-world, is confused by this. Do they mean to kill us? She whispers. Then they should just do it and get it over with. Masaletha swivels her head to the side to get a look at her great-granddaughter. You young fool. <laughs> do you not recognize an honor guard when you see one? <laughs> Then, with each impact of their dosh goes against the ground, a word begins to form on the mouths of the legions. Kres. Ka. La. Tha. Kres. Ka. La. Tha. Kres. Ka. La. Tha. And the chant just grows in power until it echoes off the marble walls of the plaza. Thousands of soldiers slamming their dosh goes, calling her name. Kres. Ka. La. Tha. Kres. Ka. La. Tha. Mastaletha glances with her good eye back towards Najili. The honor of Clan Dokfodoro has been restored, she croaks. The old Vesk turns back to the sprawling array before her and offers them all a short, sharp military nod. Now we see a stage with a large crowd of what looks like press for the most part, reporters, TV cameras and the like. Behind the podium of the stage is a brand logo for a corporation that just says Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Flash bulbs start to go off. <laughs> and everyone starts to murmur as a woman takes the stage. She's dressed in a suit that costs more than most small starships. And we re- <laughs> Somebody else from the back. <laughs> <laughs> nice suit. We recognize her. She's a little bit older now but she's the girl from episode one in Max flashback that gave oh, birth wow. to the Vesk baby that Mac yes. let die. Yes. Oh. Ooh. As she begins to speak, we cut to the TV version of her speech. It's on all the local news channels. And the lower third says, Camilla Donovan, CEO of Donovan Enterprises. The corporate Donovan logo <laughs> dissipates and two other images appear. The first is the poster of Mac that we saw that was plastered all over the packed worlds, all over Absalom Station. Remember the one with just her face that says, remember? Mm -hmm. At the time when that first started appearing, you saw it when you came back from the Drift Rock, it was a symbol. People were using it as a symbol to bring about awareness that even with the greatest technology, no one is safe from the most powerful evils that exist in the galaxy. Packed worlds or no, it was a reminder to stay vigilant. But now the image has been transformed into a corporate branding tool for Donovan Enterprises. And next to the picture of Mac is an identical picture of Linnea's face with the same word, remember. Mm. Camilla Donovan holding back emotion, perhaps not real emotion, speaks. My dear mother, McCullen Donovan, and my youngest sister, Linnea, stood up against the purest evil to save us all. Without hesitation, they made the ultimate sacrifice. And for that, we owe them. We owe them the best version of ourselves. Therefore, today it is with great honor that I am presenting our new business venture, Mac Cosmetics. <laughs> <laughs> With groundbreaking technology, 
<laughs> pioneered by my mother and successfully used on my beloved sister Linnea, we have been able to harvest the best qualities of one species and insert it into another with phenomenal results. Do you want to be as strong as a Vesk? Have you always dreamed as being as nimble as a Yosoki, as beautiful as a Lushunta? Well, now you can with MAC Cosmetics. <laughs> she holds up a, a single pill and we close in on her perfect fingers holding this pill in the air. With just a simple pill, now you too can be a Linnea Donovan. <laughs> fade out of there and we cut to a pure white room instruments are all over the place it looks like highly technological sterile laboratory of some kind and we see Dax on a slab in the middle of the room an arched sensor of some kind covers his lower half as, is he, as if he's some, in some sort of futuristic MRI machine. So we see from his torso up, only his hair is no longer spiked or blue. It's brown, short, and parted at the side. His face and body show none of the scars gained during this adventure, and his tattoos are gone. Multiple workers in sterile white lab suits are working on the body. We fade out of there. We fade up and now we see Dax awake and unconnected to any machines. He sits on a plain steel chair in a room with a mirror to one side and stares at a wall that is entirely a projection screen. He is in a simple white gown and just stares at the wall, expressionless. We see the flickering light in his face of changing images that he's watching, but we don't see what the images are. We go into a dark room adjacent to Dax's holding room and see from the back two dark figures that are silhouetted to us who look into the room through a two-way mirror. One of them says, uh, anything? And the other one looks at a readout of some kind, looks like a high-tech EKG or a polygraph. And guy's like, no. Good. We go back into the room, and now we are behind the seated Dax, looking up at this huge wall screen that takes up the entire viewing space. Through it, we see footage that is clearly from Dax's eyes. A quiet moment with Seiyun, a basketball game on Istamak. An incorporeal ghost fight inside of a hollowed out asteroid. <laughs> Meeting Callum and Linnea for the first time. Sitting around a table laughing with Alara Aquana and the crew of the Rusty Rivet. A Halloween party on Eox. A gigantic stone monument on Castrovel. And a jam session on board the Sarissa with his old pal Qualo. We cut to a close-up of Dax's face as an eyebrow moves ever so slightly and his mouth twitches a bit. A gunfight on a landing pad, the body of a dwarf surrounded by crates. Stop! We go back to the control room. Go back, one of the shadows says to the other. The video moves to the image of Qualo and Dax rocking out. There. We see Dax's eyes open wider for a second. And in the control room, we see the EKGS machine starts spiking oddly. One shadow turns and types away on the console for a few seconds. And then it's like, done, got it. The EKG just returns to normal. And we see a frozen image of Qualo and Callum during band practice on the wall. <laughs> Dax's face returns to normal. He is unmoved. He no longer recognizes these strange creatures. This goes on for hours, for days. The footage that needs to be kept in Dax's consciousness for him to function normally as a pilot, that's all left alone. Cleaned and returned to his consciousness in a manner perfected by astral extractions. 
Anything that gives him true identity or any memory of his experience since leaving the diaspora on a shuttle bound for Absalom Station is wiped from his memory bank. A nightclub encounter deep in Absalom Station in the spike, a skeleton in a previously sealed coffin, a knowing smile from Dr. Friss, all removed. Floating along a rope in open space to the drift rock while Captain Mac Donovan discussed fear and an android assassin, Kreska, opening up to the void, deleted. Time moves forward and we see somewhere in deep space Dax, once again, just driving a hauler. His face is expressionless, his day-to-day -day duties easy to understand and carry out, his skin once again plain, bland. Flash the interior of actual extractions, deep cold data storage, and his memories and effectiveness, or lack of thereof, since Joe is playing him, uh, are studied and cataloged for future understanding of how this could happen, how one of their own could be broken of the neural inhibitors so easy, but also how one could be monitored and controlled from a distance without their knowledge. We return to Dax's life and Time passes in obscurity at the edge of known space. Sometimes he gets a flash of a glitch of a memory, maybe. Whenever he sees the word Mac, or if he hears someone named Mac, it feels like that means something to him, but he can never quite place it. Something about someone dying in a pool of acid, but he can never conjure a name I never think of where it happened or how. It just seems like a bad dream. One day after finishing another boring day at work, he returns to his apartment, a tiny, unadorned, undecorated, spotlessly clean metal box that he calls home to find a strange device on his kitchen table about the size of a cred stick could hold it easily in one hand, but it has several micro controls on it that make it seem much more advanced than an ordinary cred stick. Once Dax's hands touch the device, a hologram springs from it. In a pinkish bluish haze, a, a form starts to take shape and it's an alien form completely unrecognizable to Dax. And his head cocks slightly to the side as he tries to make out where the creature's torso ends and legs begin. <laughs> I've been looking for you for a very, very long time. I know it doesn't make sense at the moment, and that you don't know who I am, but I need you to trust me. Just for a little while. <laughs> Soon you'll remember everything, but first, we've got some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> the most Blackout. trustworthy voice in the galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> if that happened to me, I would trust whatever that is. And I think in that you see like a little you see a little blinking light battery indicator by his throat, and you know what that means, but Dax doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> little flower grows out <laughs> of the hologram. <laughs> and Dax just picks it up and stares. And blackout. Now we see the exterior of the Eoxian Embassy, a cobalt skyscraper in the Parkside neighborhood of Absalom Station. A door opens and four armed skeletal guards accompany Ambassador Gevelask Nor to a space limousine waiting nearby. He gets in with two of the guards and the other two get in a car behind the limo to follow it. We then see the limo pull up to a, like a beautiful high-rise luxury apartment building. The two guards in the tailing car exit, flank the limo, and then the other two guards step out, and together, the five of them 
the four of them rather, escort Ambassador Noor to the entrance of the building. An elevator door opens, and two of the guards step out. Now, somewhere on a top floor of the building, they scan the hallway and they nod to the other two guards, and the four of them walk Gevalask Noor up to, uh, up to, like, the door of his apartment, his frozen skeletal face never quite moving. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, I don't gets think that, that never got to that was never seen on stream right that was all when the yeah, show right. was audio only <laughs> yes, I guess. Yeah. we just had to live with that nightmare. you just had to live with that <laughs> he gets to the door and there is an intricate array set up to get in nor goes through several scans of his bones his elongated elibrian cranium and whatnot and the door opens the guards go to step in and nor waves them back go there is such a thing as being overcautious. The skeletal guard is like, but Ambassador Nor, your safety is of the utmost priority. If any of those who speak lies about you wish to do you harm, away I say. You may guard the doors and downstairs as usual. I am untouchable. In unison, the four skeletal guards salute Ambassador Gevalask Nor. Two peel off to head downstairs, and two remain flanking the door to his apartment. Nor steps into a luxurious, open floor plan apartment with wide views of the Eye District below. Everything is onyx black, as if the room was sculpted out of burnt bones. Nor presses a button, shh, closes the door behind him, and... Uh, walks over to a desk with various arrays set up. He begins typing in the air with his bony figures, uh, fingers, starting up various encryption programs until he gets a clear signal, and then he speaks. It has been years now, and the Electroencephalon command key has not been retrieved from the wreckage. Hmm. While we cannot rule out the possibility that Seravox rejuvenated elsewhere and abandoned us, the more likely possibility was that the key was incinerated. A wall of text in the air appears in front of him. Or someone escaped with it, it says. <sighs> Impossible. We would have heard by, from Seravox by now. Not to mention escape from the Empire of Bones was not an option. The only ships of the Armada that returned were those that left before the impact. Everything else in near space was destroyed. More text appears. So what are our next steps? Nor thinks for a second. Well, the loss of the superweapon has set us back and has been a m massive blow to our immediate plans. It will not slow us down. By now, we have smuggled an entire corpse fleet army into this station. Once we gain control of the Star Stone, Absalom Station will fall, and one by one, the packed world planets will be ours. There's a long pause, and then a text appears that says, see that it gets done <laughs> the program shuts down nor thinks for a moment then gets up and begins to walk across the room when he stops to look out at the sprawling city below from behind we can only see his macabre reflection in the glass pane lit by the gleaming lights of absalom station and if you didn't know any better you'd think he was smiling <laughs> but then the reflection of a figure appears in the glass from behind Noor. Noor sees this and whips around quickly to see a, a young man, handsome young man, aged a bit. <gasps> but it's Callum. <gasps> <gasps> and Callum has a gun pointed on Noor. And in the shadows behind Callum, we see Seiyun, <laughs> Dr. Friss, <laughs> the new Dax, <laughs> and then this sheer
Sheeran woman that moves with <gasps> poetic grace. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God. Somewhere deep within the Sheeran's eyes is Linnea Donovan. Yeah, reincarnation. <laughs> reincarnation. Oh <my> <laughs> table. <laughs> Nor backs up slowly until his robe is pressed against the glass. He's not smiling anymore. <laughs> then we hear one, two, three, four as one of Dax, Qualo, and Callum's Vesk Metal song starts to play. <laughs> and that's the end of the series. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Revenge. <laughs> oh. oh. Fucking hell. Good job, guys. Oh, my God. Oh, oh so my great. God. So fucking oh, good. The, the team. Bro. The, the team. Yeah. The team is back together. Yeah. Oh. Dr. Frisk crawls along a ledge on the balcony outside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. I want to build new decks right now. Oh, my I know. God. I want older Cala. What is this? Witch Warper level 17? Oh, seven. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah we've all got to be like crazy. Like, oh, I want to see Soldier Jip. I want to see Soldier Jip. Yep. I want to see a Marvel movie post credit sequence that just whips around a high concept character art of each of yes. us, like blasting yes. things and taking yeah. off. Oh, yeah, man. One, two, three, four. Oh, I can't wait to hear yeah, this song. I can hear it. I can just hear it. I as can the hear it roll. too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Troy, call up, call up. Troy, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank that you. Was, I mean, you nice. guys did a lot of that work. Holy uh, shit. Thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking with us, uh, whether you started episode one or started episode 155. Uh, it has been a hell of a ride, and, and I and uh, thank you to this amazing group of people. Uh, no matter what happens in our life, we will never forget androids and aliens. Uh, see you later, Space Cowboys. Signing off. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.